Hello everyone, we're coming to you from the Imperial Ballroom at the Atlantis Resort in Paradise Island for something that has been called as revolutionary here in the Bahamas. Inspiration, upliftment, motivation, and encouragement. That's what scores of Bahamians and visitors have gathered for to receive in this very ballroom. This is Own Talks, a special edition where they have brought in world famous motivational speaker Les Brown to uplift and encourage many business owners, entrepreneurs, and those just looking to climb the ladder of success. I'm Clint Watson. Thanks so much for joining us on the broadcast. Also on the broadcast with me is Janae Noel Ferguson, who will be out and about talking to persons who have come to attend to hear this motivational exercise and to be a part of what many have dubbed as history. It's all a part of the own organization which is an affiliate of the IL Cares Foundation. For many of you who may not understand what OWN does, every year they issue grants for business owners who have aspiring businesses or great business ideas that can become a part of the business sector in the Bahamas and they help them with grants, they help them with tools on how to grow their company, marketing tips as well as educational tips. It's been going on for several years now and has been dubbed a success and this year is expected to be an even bigger year for the OWN Foundation. No doubt tonight what's happening here at the Imperial Ballroom is expected to be a launching pad for that as many businesses have already begun applying, hoping to be able to be a recipient of that scholarship. But there's one company that knows what's feels like to, to have been given a grant. They are, are the legendary faces of success, if I can call it that, um, having been awarded a grant in 2016. Um, joining me here is Dr. Selena Halber and Tim Halber, her husband. Thank you for joining us on the broadcast. Thank you for having us. It was back in 2016 when you received word that you would have received a grant of $10,000. What was that like? First of all, you had to apply for this. What was going through your mind as you heard about OWN? Well, we saw the advertisement online and we knew this was something that we had to participate in. Um, we are farmers and as you know in our country, farming is an industry that is in desperate need of growth and support. And we, we were very confident that, that we would be awarded the grant. This is a different face of farmers because typically when you grow up in the Bahamas, you think farmers are the people who are out in the sun all day sweating. And I'm sure that's a part of it, but we're now recognizing that this is a real industry, a real business that you can do well and something that we need here in the Bahamas. Absolutely. Currently importing over 90% of the food we consume, there's definitely room for growth in this industry. How difficult was it to get funding and financing from regular banks and institutions? Did you go that route? We certainly did consider it, and it is, it is quite, quite difficult. Um, that is one of the complaints many farmers have here in this country, finding funding. What was it like applying and, and no doubt getting that phone call that you had been shortlisted and successful? Well, the process was quite painless. It, it was, it, and, and because this is a dream of ours and a deep passion, it was easy to tell our story and to present our dreams and vision for the future. And once we received the call, once I got the email notifying that um, myself that we have won, um, it, it, it felt a little bit surreal, but then there was a part of me that was, let's roll, you got it. Tell us how that grant was able to assist your company. We were the recipients of the $10,000 um, grant and it enabled us to purchase a much needed piece of equipment, a walk behind tractor, that has allowed us to increase the efficiency with which we um, cultivate and produce our crops. And since then, our farm has experienced significant growth in the area of restaurant sales particularly. Tell us a little bit about your business, your farm. What do you do? Uh, what do you harvest? Tell us a little bit about that. So Field to Fork Community Farm is a two acre, two acre mixed vegetable organic farm in the Western District of New Providence. And we have been in operation since November 2012. And our products are varied. Um, we grow over 30 different types of vegetables from wow. leafy greens, fruiting crops, etc. And they are on sale at our farmer's market, a weekly farmer's market, and to various restaurants and resorts in the western end of New Providence. How would you describe this receiving this grant? Many people are, many people are looking for opportunities and uh, no doubt organizations that would fund their dream and adventure. How would you describe OWN? I, it, Working with OWN has really been very, very, very pleasant. And 
the team has been quite supportive. Um, the we had a panel of mentors that helped us in in making this business decisions. We participated in a workshop, a, I can't remember, a six week long um, Correct. class on Correct. small business ownership. That was quite informative. It I encourage everyone who has a dream, no matter how unusual it is to apply for the grant. No doubt farming has become quite technical and we've seen the advancement of using machinery and technology to improve what it is that you do. Is that today's 21st century farming? Certainly it does play a role and what we have, although we are in, in the ground, quote unquote traditional um, farmers, there is so much advance in information with respect to how you grow your crops, um, crop protection, um, treatment for insects and, and, and diseases. There's so much more new information out there today that we are taking advantage of. And anyone who's interested in farming, I encourage you to look at it through the new lens. Um, we are excited to be a part of this industry and, and hoping to advance the industry um, here in the Bahamas and to encourage a lot of new growers to look at farming under a new lens. Finally, you have the opportunity to be here today to be inspired by not only Sebastian Bastian, but also world famous inspirational speaker, Les Brown. What are you looking forward to? I am looking forward to leaving here with a new burst of energy to take my business to the next level, to think innovatively, and to just spread that inspiration for the love of what we're doing. Let's get your comment on that, Tim. What are you expecting today here at the, at the summit? Yeah, um, one of the things that Les has inspired me to is to break the molds, to not let other people's opinions about you define who you are. And, and, and we've been breaking molds in, in farming and our approach to farming and approach to food in this country. And so I'm looking forward to hearing what Les has to say to encourage us as a nation to be creative, to move forward, and to, um, to not let our past hold us back. Well, thank you and all the best to you. And I, we look forward to seeing greater success from your company. Thank you, Clint. Well, they're not the only winners. There are several others who have been down this same road and are achieving the same kind of success. Our Janae Noel Ferguson has some of them. Well, Clint, the OWN initiative is really being praised by many of the recipients as the vehicle they needed to jumpstart their business. We spoke to a number of them who said without OWN and this program, they would not be where they are today. My business is a landscape and maintenance business. Home was really important because we was a little, a little bit low on funds and doors. You know, when I asked for the grant, I got a little bit more than what I wanted. So it was a major boost. We had a chance to land more equipment, more inventory, and to keep us going from day to day. Simple as a truck. We really needed a truck. We was operating of one truck. Then we started to get, to get a lot of clientele. Our clientele branched off from Lifeweeky, Old Ford, Foxes Central, Client Treasure Go. That new truck that we got through the Home Bombers program, it really helped us a lot. It was time efficient, it was saving, and it cut down costs. And it was a diesel, it wasn't gas. So we, we, we save a lot on petrol. So I was really happy for one, and the one that granted one. When you see initiatives like this, this event tonight, how critical do you think having that motivational push is for persons who are interested in being in business? I think it's very critical for anybody who want to start their own business because a speaker like Mr. Les Brown himself, that's way more encouragement than you need. It's just, it took it from listening to him on YouTube to actually seeing him in person. And the person who made this all happen for us in the Bahamas is the entrepreneur himself. So it's a good marketing strategy as well. You know, we, we, took, it, we took a lot from it and we, we, should, we all should learn from it and we should apply to our day-to-day -day living. Now, Clint, it is standing room only at this event. In fact, the hotel had to bring in more chairs to accommodate the number of people that turned out. Now, we spoke to a number of them. They are really excited about the speakers that we will have tonight. Thanks a lot, Jenea. Well, of course, she's one of the recent winners, I should say, uh, having been granted a $10,000 grant just this year. She is Rakara Dean, and her company is called Task Bunny. Welcome, and thank you for joining us on the broadcast. Thank you for having me. You're one of the new winners. You must be really excited about that. I am, most definitely. Tell us about your business. Well, Task Bunny is an errand running and delivery service company. Ah. So what I do, I have an online, well, I will have an online platform where individuals in society can just post a task that they need done, and my freelancer can get that task done. That's so, always a good idea. People need some, always of need course. runs made. Yeah. Yes. So how was this grant able to assist you? 
but this grant was able to assist me because through the grant, I was able to do a lot of market research to um, determine what are the needs of Bahamians. Um, it also helped me to develop and design my app and mobile platform, so all of that is coming. So this grant has been a tremendous help for task running. And how has that helped you? A lot of people have to depend on financial institutions, but obviously you didn't have to worry about going to the bank. You no. had this, or it was that a beneficial for you, obviously? Yeah, it, it has been beneficial because loans were out of the question. <laughs> I just applied and I got, I got accepted. There's also the mentorship component and the training component. Was that something you were looking forward to as well? Most definitely, um, the mentorship and the training. We had a we had a course at COB, so this just introduced us to business concepts, ease of doing business in the Bahamas. So that was a great help. Would you recommend this program to other people? Definitely, I would. <laughs> if an average person like me can get the grant, I would apply, apply, apply. You can do it. You have a business idea that is phenomenal. Apply. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations to you Thank on you. your win. And we look forward to seeing great things from Task Money. Hey, yes. I'm going to need something. I'm going to need like, to buy my dry cleaning picked up. I hey? got you. I got you. <laughs> Thank you. And last question. I know you expect you're looking forward to great things from Les Brown tonight. Yes, Les Brown is like my most favorite motivational speaker. I listen to him regularly. So I'm, I feel like I'm meeting, meeting up with an old friend. <laughs> I'm excited. Awesome. Well, all the best you to you. Thank you Thank again. You. We're just about ready now to begin their calling in for the podium. And so we send you now to the start of a two-hour dynamic power pack session with motivational speaker international Les Brown and, of course, Adam Lux CEO Sebastian Bastien and others. We take you now to the podium. The Own Bahamas Foundation was founded three years ago on the simple but powerful premise that empowering Bahamians through ownership and education will be transformative for our national economy in terms of job creation and economic development. Over the past three years, the Own Bahamas Foundation has empowered approximately 40 Bahamian businesses with access to capital over $750,000 and and with the mentorship and business guidance necessary to guarantee their success. This year, our goal is to accelerate the transformation. Our belief is that sustainable job creation and economic development is not just a government responsibility. It is a societal responsibility <laughs> that requires a dynamic public-private partnership devising and exploring solutions. The own Bahamas philosophy is that a deeper commitment and investment from the private sector is not only necessary, it is a prerequisite for the Bahamas to achieve sustainable job creation. So we all have a role to play. Our government, must incentivize and promote properly functioning markets and act in the best interest of the public and not their self-interest. <laughs> the private sector, some of whom have been very blessed for a very long time, must reinvest more, and they must be more creative and innovative. The Bahamian public must 
embrace education and training, and most importantly, embrace a more enlightened attitude. This year, the OWN Bahamas Foundation will be joined by an impressive list of corporate partners as we accelerate our vision of empowerment through ownership. We thank our corporate partners, too numerous to mention, for their commitment and investment. Also, for the first time this year, the OWN Bahamas Foundation is presenting these OWN Talks seminars which are designed to empower the average Bahamian with knowledge, education, and inspiration free of charge. So stay tuned for more own talks uh, with local and internationally acclaimed inspirational and business leaders. Tonight, our speakers include Ms. Felicia Hatcher, who is a venture capital tech startup expert and a business leader. Mr. Sebastian Bastian, the founder of the Own Bahamas Foundation and Mr. Les Brown, arguably the premier motivational and inspirational speaker in the world. So again, we are happy to be here with you and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Own Talks moderator of the evening, Kay Darren Turnquist. I can't hear you! Listen. Take it down for me just a little bit. First of all, I want to share with you just some of my struggles today. How many of you were afraid on the bridge? My faith in God was just as strong as this button on my jacket. Because truly, as I was sitting on the bridge, I was thinking about how many things can possibly go wrong. But through God's grace, we've made it. Are you ready for ownership? If you're ready for ownership, let me hear you make some noise! I got a little too excited and Maybe I should stick to the beautiful teleprompter. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your moderator, Darren Turnquist, and welcome to the Own Bahamas Foundation as it presents Own Talks, Aspiration Given Wings. It is being proudly brought to you by IL Cares Foundation. I'd like to make a moment to welcome some, to, some of tonight's dignitaries, including the nation's chief, Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis. We'd also like, come on. Dr. Minnis. If he's not here, he's probably on the bridge. <laughs> and I'll tell you this much, I need another round of applause. That means I get an additional increment. <laughs> of course, the President of the Senate, the Honorable K. Forbes Smith, as well as former, former Attorney General, the Honorable Allison Maynard Gibson. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, tonight promise to, promises to be exciting. One I am happy to be able to guide you through, through this distinguished group of presenters. Ladies and gentlemen, if in fact you're ready for ownership, let me hear you make just a little bit of noise on this side. Uh -uh. Going to the struggle on the bridge, that wasn't good enough for me. Let me hear from this side. And then, I'm just gonna try those who are front and center. Now, I always wanted to be 
You know, and you want, you want to put the people who are in the church and they do this. But I never stayed in long enough because I always stuck closer to the door, which I call it and church the emergency exit. So I want to now say everybody. Without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, Felicia Hatcher is on a mission to rid communities across the globe of innovation deserts. By working with community leaders and government officials to create inclusive and diverse tech startup ecosystems. As the co-founder of Tribe Cowork and Urban Innovation Lab, Code Fever, and Black Tech Week, she's found a lot of things. A globally, globally sought-after keynote speaker presenting engaging talks at places such as Walmart headquarters. Every Bahamian needs to get to know her. <laughs> Google London, United Nations, and other countless other startup events, colleges and universities. Hatcher is also the author of six books, Start Your Own Business, on a Raymond Ramen noodle budget. I know about ramen noodles. If you ever suffered that strong, long, long, long broke periods in college, you'd know about ramen noodles focus become an epic expert poppreneurs and the c students guide to scholarships ladies and gentlemen i met her backstage she is as lovely as her biography help me welcome our very own felicia hatcher what's up y'all come on come on are lit and I love it. Give yourselves a huge round of applause. This is amazing. So for seven years, I was known as the chief popsicle of feverish ice cream and gourmet pops. A gourmet popsicle manufacturing company that I ran with my really cute husband in Miami, Florida. When I say I fell into the business, I literally fell into the business. Back before the economic downturn of 2008, I was working for Nintendo. One of those jobs that my parents told me never existed. Playing video games literally all day. And getting you guys to play video games all day. That was my job. But more importantly, it was to bring video games to life so that you guys would buy them instead of standing in the aisle of Best Buy or wherever, playing the video games while people walked all over you, my job was to literally bring video games to life, and I loved it. And if the economic downturn did not happen, I would not be on this stage speaking to you today. See, I loved my job, but there was something that I loved more than my job. Desserts. <laughs> yeah, I love desserts. I love desserts so much, I got married at a hippie donut shop almost 10 years ago in Portland, Oregon. They're like, is she for real? Yes. And we got a platter of donuts to show for it. I love desserts. And so I had this idea. I was in Miami taking a break from work. My job was almost 100% travel. It was really crazy. So when I, on one of these rare breaks that I had, I was at this party in Miami. And we were talking about how cool it would be to have like ice cream at this event. Mind you, this is before like gourmet food trucks. And so when an ice cream truck shows up to your party or your home, you're just like, this ice cream truck looks a little sketchy. Like the stickers are falling off. How long has this ice cream been in this ice cream truck? The driver is a little sketchy, right? Like, why are you driving around my neighborhood at 10 o'clock at night? <laughs> are you still selling ice cream in there? What's going on? All these questions, right? Back in the day before gourmet ice cream and gourmet food trucks. And so when you had an upscale event and you wanted the nostalgia of having ice cream when you were a kid, you didn't think about inviting ice cream trucks. It was just a mixed bag. You never knew where you were going to get. But we were talking about it. We wanted ice cream. It was hot, like it's always hot in Miami. And I kid you not, I walk out of this party and I hear ice cream truck music. And I start running after this ice cream truck like a five-year-old kid with a pocket full of nickels. Y'all know what happened next, right? I fell flat on my face <laughs> chasing after this ice cream truck in heels. 
who does that but moi? And what happens when you fall down? What's the first thing that you do? You look around, right? <laughs> you look to the left and you look to the right. Because if no one saw you, you didn't fall, right? <laughs> the ice cream truck driver saw me. Luckily, he stopped. He was laughing at me. Like, why is this grown woman chasing after this ice cream truck? What's wrong with her? I got my ice cream. And while I was on the ground, two ideas came to mind. One, I'm way too old to chase after an ice cream truck. We can all agree on that. And two, why hasn't anyone come up with a cooler way for adults to enjoy ice cream? I was kind of on the ground for a long time. <laughs> but that was my Oprah aha moment. Can I do this? Should I do this? And I like to tell people sometimes a good paying job will stand in the way of you following your dreams just as much as a bad paying job. I have to say that one more time. Sometimes a good paying job will stand in the way of you following your dreams just as much as a bad paying job. Because I loved my job at Nintendo at the time. I loved it. But I realized I was starting to compromise things about who I was and what I stood for that I no longer wanted to compromise. But I love my job. And so if the economic downturn of 2008 didn't happen, I might be still there trucking along with this binder full of ideas about ice cream and my dreams about ice cream and popsicles and my travels to Mexico and everywhere else trying ice cream all over the place, but not just like finally saying, I'm going to do it. I'm a scrappy entrepreneur. I've been a scrappy entrepreneur all my life. I've been a scrappy entrepreneur before I could even spell the word entrepreneur. I was like, preneur? How do you spell this? That's me. And so I love working with my hands, getting gritty, and figuring things out. When I was a kid, my two favorite TV shows uh, was MacGyver, right? MacGyver, come on. And my other favorite movie was Boomerang with Eddie Murphy, right? I was like, he's in that room doing all these presentations. I don't know what he's doing, but that's what I want to do. But I love MacGyver because I feel in my bones, and nobody can tell me differently, and that's why I'm in the tech space, that I can solve any problem in this world with my iPhone, some paper clips, a rubber band, <laughs> right? And so I decided to move back to Florida. Move back to my parents' house at 25 years old. And not only did I move back, I brought my husband with me. <laughs> and my parents have always been supportive of my dreams. My brother Will, uh, who's an author and a comedian and a video production like Ninja, one of the first people actually to go viral on YouTube. So if you guys find him, I'll make sure you introduce him and bombard him. But my parents have always been supportive of whatever wacky idea my brother and I came up with, which is really cool and extremely important because you need that. You need a team of supportive ninjas around you, right? Not friends and mentors, they are important, but you need ninjas. People will fight that fight for you. People that have that hope for you. So I moved back home, crazy idea, could not find another job in my field. I said, I'm gonna start this ice cream company. I have no ice cream experience, mind you. I worked at McDonald's when I was 16, so I give a lot of credit to like, being able to pull down the ice cream lever as like, my culinary genius. So I literally did everything that people tell you that you should not do when starting a business. First is probably move back home with your husband, right? To your parents' house. Don't do that. Don't live a humble life. Don't sacrifice, because you don't know if you're gonna get a return on your sacrifice. People tell you don't do that. Play it safe. Don't start a business with no experience. Don't ever do that. 
You need a ton of experience and a ton of degrees and read every book possible and meet with every person possible. Don't do that. Don't start a business with no money. <laughs> like broke pockets, don't do that. Because there's no way that you can get creative with limited resources. There's no way possible. There's no way that what you have up in here, you can leverage the contacts that you have. You can leverage. There's no way that you can possibly do that. What I have learned about the entrepreneurial journey, not just my own personal one, but all the startups that we work with and that we advise, is that there are a ton of people telling you, no, 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 no. Every octave possible that they can say no, every way that they can say no, they are going to do that. And I said, you know what? I have this dream that I, can, I just can't let go of. I'm gonna start this gourmet popsicle company. No experience, no money, technically no roof over my head. But I am going to experiment and I'm gonna figure this thing out. I had some websites that I love. So I went to the luxury shopping website, Craigslist. <laughs> I used the last bit of my savings and bought two ice cream carts, two tricycle ice cream carts. They were ugly, guys. Oh, they were ugly. Didn't even have enough money to get them professionally graphic wrapped. Went back to Amazon and bought some plastic molds. I was like, I am just gonna experiment and figure this out. Went to good old Home Depot, kind of channeling MacGyver, right? It's like, I don't have enough money to get these carts professionally graphic wrapped, so I'm gonna go get some spray paint, because that's what we do when we're scrappy, and we're gritty, and we're mission-driven. And I'm gonna get some decals that are supposed to go on the wall, but I'm just gonna put these on the cart. And the funny thing about when you finally decide to hit the button and say, go, and I'm not gonna let any excuses stop me. When Oprah says the world conspires to assist you in building your dream, it absolutely does. Because all that grittiness that I was putting together, the jankiness of what I was putting together in my parents' backyard, spray painting these carts, it was also the time where the whole DIY culture sprouted up. You guys know what I'm talking about? The whole do-it-yourself culture. And so for the first time in a long time, we actually liked imperfections in products. I know, it sounds crazy, right? But we would buy things that had little dents and little scratches because we knew that it was handmade or homemade or that that was the original one that we were getting and there were no other ones like that. So launching this cart company with popsicles and ice cream that I made in my parents' kitchen, that I spray painted these carts in my parents' backyard, People loved it, and I couldn't understand at first, like, what do you mean, like, this is so cool, this ice cream is delicious. I'm like, if you only knew what I was doing in the backyard last night, spray paint still under my nails. Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn famously said, if you are not embarrassed by your first product, you waited too late to start. And I was hella embarrassed of those carts, guys. I will be honest. I'm not even gonna show you a picture of what they look like because they were just that bad. But it allowed me to create an MVP, a minimal viable product of the idea that I had, of this thing that I wanted to build, that I wanted to put out into the world, an idea that I just could not let go of until I just saw it come to life. And many of us, overthink ourselves over and over and over again our ideas. Ideas are worthless and execution is absolutely everything. And so sometimes we see people, we'll see it, we're sitting on an idea. A month goes by, two months goes by, three months, a year, and then all of a sudden you're watching TV, you're watching Shark Tank, and you're like, I don't believe it. This whatever, whatever expletive words stole my idea. This person lives all the way on the other side of the globe, doesn't know you from Adam, can't get into your brain, but somehow they stole your idea. 
And more than likely, it's not the exact same idea. It doesn't look as good as you thought that it was gonna look inside your head, but it's out there. And the sharks love it. And the sharks gave them funding. And you get even more and more and more upset because ideas are worthless and execution is absolutely everything. So you have to ask yourself, what ideas am I sitting on every single day? Who am I not reaching out to to help me get one step further to this goal? Guys, starting out in the very beginning is ugly. You sometimes look ugly doing it, right? I never, I didn't look like this, all makeup and all that stuff when we were first starting. We were in grind mode because we had no other choice. There was no plan B. There was no plan C. No one was hiring us. No one was hiring me. So I had no other choice than to make this happen, to see where this was going to go. Funny story, guys, about this ice cream company. And so we got a phone call. This is back in MySpace days, right? I'm dating myself a little bit. MySpace, yes. I had set up a profile about our company, Feverish Ice Cream and Gourmet Pops, on MySpace. So we do events and things like that. I really didn't want to be a neighborhood ice cream truck because, one, if you know anything about the mobile vending industry, it's kind of gangster, y'all. Like, people are real territorial and they will cut you. <laughs> and so, Everyone going out at, in the daytime and going to the schools, like they had their territory. They'd been there for like 20 years. And I was rolling up with my carts and I could get closer to the kids than they could. They weren't having it. So I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go out at night. And I'm going to target adults because no one was reaching out to adults. Right? So if you're building a niche, if you can't be number one or number two, you create your own niche that you can be number one in. Right? What's the number one beverage? Does anyone know? Coca-Cola? What's number two? What's number 18? No one knows, right? And so many of us have ideas, and we're going into oversaturated industries. And sometimes if we just dig one level deeper, we'll find something that we can win a gold medal in. But most times we won't do that work. And so I'm like, hey, you know what? It's gangster here, I get it, y'all wanna own the kids, fine. We're gonna go out at night. We're gonna go out to nightclubs, we're gonna go to fashion events, we're gonna go to parties, we're gonna go to everywhere that people like my age hang out. Because once they drink, they want something to eat. It was like simple math there. But moreover, I wanted to create a lifestyle brand and not just like a food product. I also wanted to do catering, because I'm like, hey, we can sit out here all day at a farmer's market or whatever, or someone can hire us for two hours, buy a few hundred or buy a few thousand bars, and we're good. I said, that's what we're gonna do. So I set up this, this uh, profile on MySpace, and the phone rings. And it's a funny thing about the phone rings, r phone ringing, because a lot of times we prey on things, we want things to happen. We pray on things some more. And then when that thing happens, we don't know what to do. Because most times we plan more about how we're gonna deal with our failure than how we're gonna prepare for our success. And so that phone rung. And it was a company in Jupiter, Florida. So about an hour away from my parents' house. And they were, it was almost Christmas time, and they were like, hey, I saw your prof profile on MySpace. I'm like, okay, cool. And we, ha we want you to come and supply your popsicles and ice cream for our office party. It's our holiday party. And I was like, okay, we can do that. We've been doing that for a while. <laughs> Mind you, this is like the first time the phone rung, right? <laughs> And she was like, 500 employees. I'm like, okay, cool, we can definitely handle that. And she's like, okay, what do you need? Do you need like a deposit or? Yes, um, I was just getting ready to say that we need a deposit. 50% to be exact. 
And okay, she's like, okay, how do you, how do you take that? I'm like, let me draft up the contract and I will call you back and tell you, you know, the process so that we can book you. I had never taken credit cards before, right? <laughs> or a deposit or anything. But I was not gonna turn that down because that is literally what I had been asking God for, is this opportunity. And a really good mentor of mine said, if you can do something, you say yes, and then you figure it out, right? <laughs> Guys, the story gets so much crazier. So we were preparing for this. It had been a few weeks before the actual event. And a week before the event, she calls. We got the deposit, we're doing, we're, we're doing good. 500 people, yes. We ready, right? And she was like, oh, I forgot to ask, do you guys have an ice cream truck? Because we really actually want an ice cream truck. And I was like, man, I don't know if this is what God was saying about being prepared and what my mentor said about like saying yes. And I was like, we got an ice cream truck. And I went back to the good old luxury shopping website, Craigslist, and I found a Chevy P30 ice cream truck. Y'all, that truck was 30 years older than me. That's what the 30 stood for. <laughs> and I used the money and I bought this truck off of Craigslist, went back to Home Depot, spray painted that truck. We had it, it was working pretty well. I know nothing about automotive anything. Like repairing them, making sure that they run long distances, nothing. And remember I said I, ha I have a really cute husband who started this company with me. He loved the idea. This is the time that it started to waver a little bit, right? Same thing with my parents, that glimmer in their eye when I drove up to their yard with a 40-year-old ice cream truck, or 50-year-old ice cream truck, that was the first time in their eyes, like, I don't know what my daughter is doing with her life. <laughs> Anyways, we get this truck. A day before we're supposed to go do this event, we're supposed to drive it up to Jupiter, a day before we're supposed to do this, the truck stops working. Yes. The truck stops working. It won't drive long distances like the hour we needed it to drive there and drive back. It'll drive a short distance like a block <laughs> and then cut off. And then we gotta wait like 10 minutes and then it'll turn back on and drive like another block. And so I said, you know what? We gonna figure this out because we already spent this deposit, babe. What are we gonna do? One of my neighbors had a tow truck company. <laughs> this is my life, y'all. One of my neighbors had a tow truck company. And I was like, we're just gonna tow it to the place, get off a block away. <laughs> We're gonna drive this truck that block, serve this ice cream, babe, and we're gonna get back on that truck, get it back on that tow truck, head back to my parents' house and cash that check, right? <sighs> the company called again. And they were like, you know what? We're, everyone in the office is so excited about you guys coming. We wanna add another stop. Yes, I know, right? I'm like, seriously, lady, like you don't understand what we're going through. We wanna add another stop. And they're like, you know, they're like maybe a five minutes from each other. So I'm like, okay. We get to Jupiter. We get the truck off the tow truck. A block away, we're driving it. We serve everybody. This is the office that had 50 people. It was our first stop. Serve everybody, everyone's happy, smiles, everything. 
get the truck, we drive it back to the tow truck, which was around the corner. <laughs> get it back on the tow truck, driving to the next event. The tow truck stops, we get off. All we had to do was make a right turn. This semi comes by and stops. Oh, like, he's here. All we needed to do was like this. Waiting for him. I don't know what he was doing. Checking my space? Like, I don't know what he was doing. The truck stops. We are literally like from here to there. And in the interim of the truck stopping, they make the announcement to 450 employees that the ice cream truck is here, come outside. <laughs> Everyone's like, I never want to be an entrepreneur ever again. Like, this is horrible. They make the announcement to 450 employees that the truck is outside and the truck cannot move. And this time, Betsy is like dead. She's not moving. <laughs> I am mortified. We're trying, like, we're trying. We're, we're doing everything, like, that we can possibly, it's not moving. My husband is saying words to me that would lead us to divorce if I repeated them out loud. <laughs> but it was like, something, 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 this is the worst idea ever, right? <laughs> the vice president of the company comes out, and he was like, what is going on? Like, why won't you guys come over to the pavilion? All the employees are outside. There's no more getting creative with limited resources here, right? Which is my mantra. There's no more of that. And we had to tell him, like, sir, we don't know what happened. <laughs> the truck is just not, it just stopped working. And something that I will never forget happened. The vice president of this company took his blazer off, told me to get into the front seat and put the truck in neutral told my husband to get to the back of the truck, and both of them pushed the truck to the employees. I was mortified, y'all. You talk about being embarrassed and wanting to quit. I don't think anybody would have blamed us for quitting that day, right? We served all 450 people with like a half smile, like, smiling, because you can't not smile for ice cream, right? But mortified because every other employee was like laughing at us and throwing jokes and like all these different things. My husband, who at the end of May I will be married to for 10 years, quit that day. <laughs> On that truck, he was like, I am done. I'd rather go work back at Subway, which was his job when he was 16, than deal with your foolishness and this truck. Guys, that company was our client every year for the seven years that we ran that company until we sold it. And if we would have given up that day, everything that we accomplished out of it, I see, I still hear people laughing. It was like, that girl in that truck, she's crazy. If we would have given up that day, everything that has happened to us and the most amazing things that have happened. Being featured on the Today Show, being featured on the Cooking Channel, being honored as one of the top 100 entrepreneurs under the age of 30 by the White House. <laughs> Countless awards, amazing clients, Google, PayPal, Forever 21, Trump at one point, ah, goodness. <laughs> We just kind of took his logo off of all the, like, the decks, but whatever, you know? <laughs> Capital Records, Universal Records, like, I can go on and on on how a gourmet popsicle company started by two people who almost quit within the first year. All the clients, all the amazing employees that we hired, some we fired, but we hired, and the thousands of clients that we had and the thousands of people that we served in our stores with our carts, none of that would have happened if we quit that day.
Guys, what I can promise you about entrepreneurship, and it's really glamorous right now, all the startup founders, all the people that start in their parents' garage and then they IPO the next day, you're just like, how did that happen? <laughs> all the glamour around it. But it's hard work, y'all. And you have to be willing to not only put in the work, but sacrifice like ever before. And most people talk about that return on investment, ROI, and trust me, I love it. But what's important to me is that ROS, that return on the sacrifice that you make. I have lost friends, probably lost some family members in the process. I've lost clients, I've lost sleep. I have wanted to give up more times than I can count. And I'd like to be very honest with my failure stories because I think that's what really empowers you more than me telling you about awards and like shows and speaking all over the globe, like all of that stuff. It's those dark days when life has literally punched you in the gut and you have no idea how to get up the next morning. To me, that's what passion actually is. Passion isn't this thing that lives out there. It's that thing that lives in your heart. And this is that gut check moment every single time. Do you have it in you to wake up the next morning? When your top client leaves you and you don't know how to make payroll, do you have it in you to wake up and have that conversation with your employees the next day? What, ha what happens when your bank account goes negative? Oh, we all know that, right? I wrote the book, like, Start a Business on a Ramen Noodle Budget. I know about that. What do you do when life punches you in the gut and you start a business? What do you do? These are actual realities. And I think if I share these with you, you understand that you're not alone in the process. It happens to everybody. I remember one time I wanted to close Feverish down. I worked in marketing for a long time, and I worked in tech, Nintendo, Sony, I worked for the NBA, worked for some really cool companies. My mom's from Jamaica, and when I left my job at the NBA, she just didn't, she couldn't put that together. Like, why are you leaving that good job with benefits and no? Anyways, she's proud of me now, right? But it's those days when life punches you in the gut that most people just don't understand. Most people don't share those things. Because when you open up Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine, it's nothing but people that, I had an idea, and then the next day, Google bought my company for $400 million. You're like, wait a minute, like, what you ate for breakfast? Like, what did you do in between that? What were those dark days? Why are we so obsessed in our society to gloss over the struggle? The struggle is real, y'all. My dad shared with me a really important story a few years ago when I was thinking about quitting. There was a company out of Seattle that wanted me to go and market cheese. I can sell cheese, yes. I've sold video games. I was with Sony when they should have uh, they should have invented the iPad, but they didn't, a whole other story. I can go sell cheese and, pay, and make way more than what I was able to pay myself with Feverish. And we had a really rough winter. I'm like, I'm leaving this. I'm gonna take a break, I'll be back. And I have a conversation with my dad, and he said, if you leave this company, you're never coming back. And I understand that you were struggling, but there was one time, my dad owns a construction and development company, and there was one time where he, he's like, I ran my company into $300,000 in debt. And he's like, when you get on my level, you can talk about quitting. But until then, you got a cart and some ice cream, go out and sell some popsicles. And I needed to hear that. I needed someone that I knew, that I respected, to be extremely honest and vulnerable with me about their failures. That allowed me to keep going. I need four volunteers really quick before I close out. Right here, right here. I'll take the first four because I can hardly see. I said four, y'all. I know y'all can count. One, 
two, three, four. Right here, right here, right here. Thank you. All right. Can they come up on the stage really quick? Hurry, 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 hurry. All right. All right. So, so much about entrepreneurship is around like the idea, right? Having the idea, pitching the idea, selling the idea. You guys each have 30 seconds to make something that you can sell to me, starting now. Make something that we have now? Yeah, you have 30 seconds to make, actually you have 25 seconds now. Whatever you, you know, you have 20 seconds to make something that you can sell to me. Fifteen. Whatever you want to do. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You ready? Like ready or not, here we come. You're gonna say your name and you have 10 seconds to now tell the audience what is it and why we should invest in this or buy it. Ready, starting now. This is not just a paper airplane. It's actually a romantic way of sending a note. A love note, I'll like fly it I like to you. That. What's your name? What's your name? Kamisha Wells. Kamisha Wells? All right, right here. All right, what this is, this is not just a traditional white paper fan. We have to sit down and keep our makeup fist, so mm -hmm. we want to make sure we fan ourselves perfectly and look good while we're doing it. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, what's your name? Alex Thompson. Alex Thompson. All right, right here, the only guy up on the stage <laughs> holding it down for all the fellas in the room. Okay, uh, They're like, you better come correct, bro. You better come correct. <laughs> fresh up. <laughs> the fresh up. <laughs> come on, we're we running out of time. 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Um, okay, um, this isn't just any funnel. This is a funnel that you can use to... <laughs> 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 At this point, every, any and everything that you would always want to have in a funnel. Okay, your name, your name. Andrew. Andrew, Andrew all right. Last but not least. Janet Hensley Hale, what I have in my hand is your to-do list. Ladies, busy mothers, busy dads, write that to-do list down for us. Our company will come and we will definitely do everything on this list for the right price. Thank you. Yo, sign me up. Right? Listen, my to-do list is like a mile long. You sure? Because I like, sign me up. All right, guys, really quick. Crowd of applause is going to determine the winner. And I got a really awesome prize for the winner, OK? Tell me your name again. Tamisha Wells. On, on three. There can only be one winner, y'all. Work with me. One, two, three for Kamisha. One, two, three for Alex. Okay, okay, okay. Kamisha, you brought people half the room here? What's, what's going on? Tell me your name again. Oh, Andrew. Andrew. One, two, three for Andrew. <laughs> the, you hear all them deep voices like, we gotta represent. Tell me your name again. Janet. Okay, on three for Janet. On two, three. I think, I think Kamisha might be the winner. All right, let me hold this. All right, so for all my participants, I have a copy of Start Your Business on a Ramen Noodle Budget for you. Thank you. Go ahead, you can take that, and I'll make sure Will gets to the rest. For you, a one-on-one, -on -one, one-hour consulting session with me, okay? All right? So make sure I get your contact info. Yeah. All right, really quick, you can go ahead and sit down, but make sure I get your contact info. Guys, really quick. What were my instructions? No, before that. 
What were my instructions? They were very clear. Make something that you could sell to me. And then what did I do? I gave everyone a piece of paper. The exact same piece of paper. But at no time did I say they had to use the paper. <laughs> so while all the ideas were amazing, because there's value within thinking on your feet, right? Being able to be creative with limited resources. There's value in that. But what so happens so much when we talk about entrepreneurship and we talk about innovation, even the space that I work in, in tech, most times we come up with grandiose ideas. But most times we only innovate and create with what's handed to us. Most times, we put ourselves in boxes. I never told them that they couldn't get off this stage, that they couldn't work together, right? Because four pieces of paper are better than one. I never told them that they couldn't sell me literally anything in this room, because if they got my laptop, I would give them my child to get it back. <laughs> And so our failure to execute, our failures to innovate, but the areas of opportunity, and the areas to create, the areas and the roadway to millions is doing the things that other people will not do, is not asking for permission, but asking for forgiveness. Sometimes you don't ask for forgiveness at all because you hit it out the park. But what we cannot do and what you will not do after you leave here, is continue to put yourselves in boxes. You guys have to promise me that. The other thing that I need you to promise me is this, this is the first annual OWN Talks, y'all. I didn't even like that. Did you like that? I didn't like that. This is the first annual OWN Talks. So when I get off this stage, and I look at Twitter, and I look at Instagram, and I look at social media, you guys better take this experience viral. Because the speakers tonight are amazing. The room that they've put together so that you guys can collaborate and work together and make boss moves together, that's what this experience is about. And so if you want more events like this, you want to show everyone and show the globe what the Bahamas has to offer, because y'all are lit. <laughs> then you take that picture, whether it's a selfie, whether it's an ussy, like whatever y'all do, share this experience with the world. Because when you do that, it makes room for pure genius to continue to come out of the Bahamas and across the Caribbean. So guys, My favorite quote, and I'm going to leave you with, I wake up every morning and say it to myself, is Felicia. You can, you know, replace your name there. Do the things that scare you every single day because the world does not benefit from you hiding your badassery. Thank you, guys. Oh. Can we get, can we get a, a selfie for the gram really quick? Is that cool? All right. Huh? Oh, Lord, will that mess me up? See, I had an amazing, like, outro. I was getting ready to strut off the stage, and then he just messed me up. All right, guys, on three. If we can say own talks on three. One, two, three. Own talks. Yes, thank you, guys. I got a Come on, ladies and gentlemen, give them a round of applause! So listen, if you have your cell phones on you, I keep jumping, and I hope I don't fall. You want to hashtag ILCares, hashtag ILTV, hashtag Own Talks. Hey, you all right? Good to see you. Hashtag Own Talks, hashtag all of those things. If you have a feeling that tonight's going to be a good night, 
Make some noise! Now, there was an interesting thing that you all did tonight when I was walking through, and it, it made me feel like how these talks are making some of you feel. Excited, ready to go. Anybody want to do an experiment with me? Oh, anybody want to do an experiment? Two people, just two people. Come for me. One other person. One more person. Come, come, come for me, come quick, come real quick. Now, while I was going through the, 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 the walkway, you all made me feel as though I was a part of a football team. Oh, everybody's running. Okay, you take that way, go right there like the Bahamas Air Flight Attendant. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. <laughs> all right, now what I want you to do is, play that music again, play it under me, you like, you know. Yeah, give me some music. Now I want you to reach out and just give them a high five, keep them going, you're gonna run straight down and you're gonna run back and tell me what you feel like, because let me tell you, in the Bahamas we don't encourage each other enough. And so this is encouragement time, this is ownership time. On the count of three, pump the music. One, two, three, go! Go for now. She's ready to go again. Give them a round of applause. The interesting part about this, as I heard Felicia speak, one thing I know I'm good at, I, I'm a scrappy entrepreneur. I, I have a lot of scrappy things in my life, but the key to that is don't give what? Don't give up. But the, the other thing that I like is at 37 years old, I still live at home. Whew. Food on the table, no bills to pay. Why should I run away? But nonetheless, after own talks tonight, I know that I can still be great. And I can still win. And I can still do amazing things. Let's give own talks a round of applause. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the next man I'm about to introduce really needs no introduction. In professional circles, he is Mr. Bastian, but for others like me and you, you probably know him as Sabas. He, come on now. Sabas. Come on now. Sabas. He's a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and the mastermind and find, founder of Own Bahamas. He needs no other introduction as he will tell you his own story. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Island Lock CEO, Sabas Bastian. Come on! Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. And I want to say a special good night to all you future entrepreneurs tonight. Behind every successful story, you will find someone that has made a courageous decision. Many of us don't realize an entrepreneur isn't someone that owns a business. An entrepreneur is someone that jumps off the cliff and builds a parachute on the way down. Tonight, many of you have walked into my life in chapter nine. And as you go about life, you will learn that people will judge you based on the chapter of your life they decide to enter in. And a wise man once told me, if you don't tell your own story, someone will tell it for you. From the tender age of seven, I was working every Saturday helping my father grill steaks at his restaurant. I missed out on most of the festivities kids my age were doing on the weekends. Instead, I was covered in so much barbecue sauce and smoke, I don't know what my little girlfriend at the time saw in me. <laughs> For my 13th birthday, 
My father turned over the steak business to me, told me I could keep the profits we make each Saturday. It wasn't much, but it taught me at a very young age the importance of budgeting, good customer service, and most of all, sacrifice. And that brings me to one of my business ABCs, letter S, sacrifice. Sometimes to be successful, you gotta be willing to give up sleep. And if you wake up broke this morning, you ain't had no business going to sleep last night. This is powerful. Because while you were sleeping, successful people was up working on how to monetize your laziness. We have to remember, success is never owned. It's rented. And rent is due every single day. So to be successful, you got to put in the time. You got to be willing to put in the passion. You got to be willing to put in the effort if you really want to have any shot in hell and making that venture work. Let's start talking about savings. Ladies. <laughs> Ladies. Don't be the woman with the $1,000 purse and nothing in it. And fellas, 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 calm down. Calm down, because I ain't forget with y'all. Fellas, don't be that guy driving that fancy car and still live home with your Grammy. I just drive a Toyota Camry hybrid and I got a couple dollars. So think about that. Stop spending all your money trying to show people that you are living a life that you cannot afford. The system, oh, that system. The system is already designed to make success difficult for all of us. Think about it. You need money for college, college for a job, and a job for money. Now, if that ain't rigged, I ain't know what rigged. They say education is the key. Then why they make it so expensive for we? And that's why it's so important to save because we're already starting 10 steps back, so we can't continue to keep ourselves back with all this material foolishness. Your funding, your ideas will require funding. And these banks, these days, you know, the bank ain't lending you no money. So it's very important to save your money and put it towards your dreams. You know, and listen, it can be times when you just can't do it. You don't have enough of them. You don't have all the money that it requires. And that's where you have to learn to pool your resources. Start turning some of these lifetime friendships into partnerships. You know, your best friend can't be only willing to go to regatta with you, gossip with you. She got to be willing to make that bump with you. <laughs> I got accepted to sack. The big red machine, they used to call it, in grade seven. I was so excited. I was so excited. And that joy came to an abrupt end when I finally had to repeat grade seven. In fact, the only good thing about my GPA, that it was a good tree ball to buy. 1.42. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's somewhere between dumb and finish. In grade nine, I get kicked out of sock. I don't know why I get kicked out of sock yet. I ain't do nothing. I never was no fighter. I was a lover. I, liked, I used to sell stuff. I don't know why I get kicked out yet. But anyway, I got kicked out of sock. And I can call her name because she said it. I remember the words Sister Noella said to me. She said, Sonny, I can read about you. She said, Sonny, you ain't never going to make it. I packed my Georgie bundle. 
Went to Bahamas Academy in grade 10. I got suspended my first week for selling bamboo shark on campus. Little did I know that Venice frowned on conk. And it wasn't long after that same suspension, I got, I got suspended again for selling candies and gum, but this time the sentence was a little lighter. It was just something about buying and selling that intrigued me. And after school, each day, I'd have to sit in the hot car till 5 o'clock when my mother get off. And one day, I wandered into the IT room of British American. And it was then, at that age of 15, I learned from the guys in the IT room how to fix computers. The money I'd saved from the steak business, I was able to buy my first set of parts to put together my first computer which I sold to one of my teachers at uh, Bahamas Academy. <laughs> and by the way, she never finished paying me. <laughs> but I'm not going to call her name. <laughs> I used to duck school every other Friday, fly to Miami, buy computer parts, and be back before anyone knew I was missing. I reinvested all the money that I made from the first computer into buying more parts, build more computers, which I later continued to sell throughout high school. But it was my last day of school, which was one of the greatest lessons of my life. It was graduation night. The man was talking for an hour. I can't tell you what he said yet. <laughs> and what caught my attention was when he said, and before I leave, <laughs> it was the late Sir Lyndon Oster Finland. He said, before I leave, Sometimes, he said, sometimes the elevator to success will be broken and you're just going to have to take the stairs. And that stuck, that stuck with me all of my life. I'll never forget it as long as I live. In October of 1998, I went off to college in Miami. That first weekend, drove down to Circuit City to buy me a satellite. If you all don't know, in 98, the, the little dish had just come out. It had just gone on sale for $49. I bought one, and as I was loading it in my car, I felt this tap on my shoulder, and it was the sales guy that had just sold me the satellite. So I said, yeah. And he said, he said do you need help setting it up? I said, no, I'm pretty technical. I don't need, I don't need your help. So he said, oh, I could get you all the channels for free. <laughs> well. If you know us behemoths, <laughs> when we hear the word free, I quickly changed my response to, I am definitely going to need some help. <laughs> he gave me a number for this guy and told me when I called the guy to tell him that he had referred me. So I got home, called the number, this Jamaican guy answered the phone, showed up to my house two hours later, this laptop and this funny looking black box with a green light on it. Takes my satellite card, stick it in the box, does something on the keyboard, hand it back to me, I put it back in the receiver, and all the channels come in. <laughs> my brain started racing. I was so fascinated, I said, man, look here, how I could get one of them? <laughs> he responded to me, and I'll never forget his voice for as long as I live. He said, give me $7,000 money, I'll get you one of them things. So, you know, I had the act called Big Shot. I say, yeah, man, I can call you next week. <laughs> Don't worry about that, I can call you next week. But I didn't have the $7,000. All I had to my name was the couple of dollars I had saved from the, from the steak business, and a couple that leave over from the computers, and that was already allotted for me to put towards my portion of the school fee. So, later on that week, following week actually, my father sent some money over to help for me to put with my money to pay the balance of the school fee. <laughs> it was $10,568. I know that because I stared at the bank balance for three days. <laughs> and I later came up with this idea. I went to the admissions office 
what a, what a beautiful falsified story. And I said, Miss, my daddy just lost his job. The whole family depending on me. I'm the only one that was able to go off to college. And I hear you getting one contract in two months, and we was wondering if we could just put down $3,000 on the school fee and pay the rest after two months. And I dropped my head. And the lady said, sure. We, we're here to help our, we here to help our students. We do this all the time. It's no problem. You can put down the $3,000. It's no problem. The fake tears quickly dried up. <laughs> Break off running to my cell phone, the call that Jamaican guy, and when he answered the phone, I said, I got the $7,000 money. <laughs> Come over to the condo, showed me how to use the system, showed me how to use the little black, the little black box with the light on it and everything. He left. Then, I'm sitting there, and I just realized that perhaps I'd taken one of the biggest chances in my life to date. My parents didn't have no more money to spend on me. I didn't have no more money to spend on me. And the last time I checked, no one in my family catched the lotto. So suddenly, I realized that I had jumping off a cliff, and I would have to start building my parachute real quick. At this point, it was clear that I hadn't thought this idea completely through. I just spent all of my tuition on a machine. I had no plan, no customers. There was no Instagram and Facebook. In fact, in those days, the internet was a luxury. I sat down feeling so scared and defeated, and I started to think, where the hell did this idea come from? And then I remembered, it started with this guy that tapped me on my shoulder outside of Sacred City. So I jump in my car, and I drive down to Sacred City. <laughs> he was standing right there scamming another a Caribbean place with a satellite. <laughs> and this time, it was me doing the tapping. I tapped him on his shoulder. I said, you know, I want to talk to you outside. And we went outside, and I said, listen, I got one of them things. He said, what things? I said, the black box with the light on it. He said, what? I said, the thing that is programmed the card. I said, and, and if you say, anyone you send to me, I'll give you $50. He said, what? That's a better deal than a Jamaican fella giving me. <laughs> so he took my number, he shook hands, I left, started to head back home. And as I was about to turn inside the gate, the phone rang. And it was the guy from Sacred City. And he called me and said, hey, I got two clients for you. Gave me an address, turned around, drove to the clients. I made $800 on my first night. And I knew right there that technology was going to be the breakthrough in my life. And this brings me to my business, ABC's letter T, technology. Every single day, technology is replacing people, jobs, even companies. If you're planning a business right now, and you don't have technology integrated into it, you're probably going to fail before you even start. Now, a lot of y'all sitting there saying that I know truth. Well, let me tell you why it's true. Even if you is a gardener, you're supposed to be taking your appointments to cut the grass online. <laughs> even if you're a barber, you should be taking your appointments and receiving payments online. You know, and there's that, there's that thing that is with us no matter where we are, no matter where we go, no matter what we're doing, and that's the cell phone. The convenience factor coupled with the fact that this young generation is addicted to the mobile phone opens a tremendous amount of opportunities for aspiring entrepreneurs. Look at all the successful apps around us. They're designed to make our life more convenient, and that's true. But what they're really doing is cashing in on a lazy society. You have to open your mind and see where the future is going. So my advice to everyone, think technology when you're planning 
your next business venture. We gotta stop, we gotta, we gotta think beyond restaurants and bars and clothing stores and snack shops and beauty supply stores and salons and start embracing new trends and recognize that the, the world has evolved and every single thing depends on technology. Now let's talk about teamwork. If you want to go fast, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, you have to go together. You must build a great team around you to be successful. But mind you, you got to be strong enough to do it alone, smart enough to know when you need help, and brave enough to ask for it. You know, there was a time in my life when I was a one-man band. I thought I could do anything. But I quickly realized if I wanted to make it big, I would have to surround myself around some really smart people. Look at this room. You think I do this by myself? Look at it. Tonight is a clear example of how beneficial and resourceful a strong team will bring to bringing your vision to life. So what have we learned so far? That sacrifice is key, budget and savings go hand in hand, and that we must evolve with technology. So that brings us to time. Life ain't fair. God knows life ain't fair, and neither is it equal. But every single person in this room and in the world got the same 24 hours a day and the same seven days a week, period. So there's no excuse about time. You have the same time that I have. And I got two children. I went there. We didn't get there. <laughs> time is going to be your most precious commodity. And what you spend your time on will determine your level of success. And speaking of time, let's get back to the story. It was early Monday morning. One Monday morning, and it was about two hours before it was time for me to go to, to class, and I was faced with my second biz, biggest challenge to date. Here I was, I was young, I was dedicated, I was determined, I was focused, and I had this green black box with a green light on it. And then this image in my head came of, with my professor, this shirt he used to wear three times a week with the third button missing. <laughs> Drove a Nissan Sentra, no hook caps. Listen, I had some amazing teachers in my time, but I remember sitting there thinking, how is this guy going to teach me how to make it big when he clearly ain't make it big for himself? I was sitting in class every day, my phone ringing off the hook. The Jamaican fella get, beating me to the deal, getting all the jobs. And I didn't have the time to capitalize on it. And that was it. After 42 days, two days before Black Friday, I'd made up my mind that college ain't for me. <laughs> Going forward each morning, I would park in Sacred City Yard, lay the chair back, and wait on the phone to ring. You know, on weekends, I'd sneak home to Nassau, unbeknown to my parents, you know, service all my clients, because you know you could get double the price down here, and now I saw all behemoths couldn't find a satellite back then. You know? And it was like May of 99, I'd done that for about six months and made a couple of dollars, and I was, in, I was in town on my normal weekend sneakiness, and I was about to, I was wrapping up my last job before I head back to the airport, and I got this call from this lady, and she wanted a full system. Well, let me walk you through the full system. You buy the system for $49, and you sell it in Nassau for $800. So my hands were tied. That's a flight I just couldn't catch. So took the directions down, showed up to the woman's house, rang the doorbell. When she opened the door, it was one of my mother co-workers. <laughs> she didn't know who she was calling. I didn't know who I was going to. You know, she said, oh, I don't know you do satellite. No, no, I don't do no satellite. I don't do no satellite. No satellite. I just, I help a friend. You get poisoned with barracuda. I have a friend. I don't do satellite, you know. 
you know, and I tried to water it down as much as I could. And she paid me, I flew back to Miami. That Monday, the voicemail was full. Now, I don't know if you all know my mother. But anyway, we can go there. And I got this text from my father. He's coming to Miami that Friday. because They need to know what's going on. Because I answer them all week. <laughs> I went down to Citibank. I used to bank to Citibank back then. And I got this manager's check payable to my father for $30,000. Went to Walmart. No, it wasn't Walmart then. It was Kmart. Walmart wasn't even around then. And I got a Polaroid camera and got my friend. We went in front of the college, and there was this plaque on the college wall that said EST 1956. So, <laughs> I posed next to the, the plaque and I took a picture. A lot of them came that weekend, sat down, I, I slide this envelope over them. So, you open up the envelope. He pulled out this picture. He didn't know what it, what it was. And then he looked at this check and he said, Oh, Lord, he's doing drugs. <laughs> I said, Calm now, 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 calm now. So I, you know, I broke it down, explained to them what I was doing. And, and I said, Listen, ma, and then I said, I said, Listen, that school had been around from 1956. That's almost 40 years ago. And if God may have it, it can be around for another 40 years. <laughs> So if I make it a mistake with my life, that thirty thousand dollars is for you to send me back to college. <laughs> so they both said all their disappointments, and mother said she washed my hands off me, <laughs> and the old man say I thrown away my life, and they got up and left, but he got a check. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, and, you know, so, but I was free. I was free. The first thing I did was I fly to Nassau and I go on by the East Street Show Shopping Plaza and they had no more space left. All they had was one uh, a little hole in the wall that was supposed to be the stairs that take you up to the second floor that they never built. So I said, and I said how much are you going to rent it for for me? He said, 150 and I said, I'll take it. You know, went to Las Vegas for the first time, attended the CES show, which is the Consumer, Consumer Electronics Trade Show in January of 2000. And while I was there, I was able to meet all sorts of manufacturers and distributors for electronics, and a lot of my stuff that I was buying at the time, I was now able to source directly because of the, my exposure to this trade show. And I can't stress how important it is for you to continue to expose yourself, visit trade shows, build connections, yeah. Think outside, of, there is no box to think outside of. Later that year, the telco had announced that they were launching prepaid cellular. And I remember I had to pick up one pamphlet while I was at the trade show in Las Vegas from a company called Opal Manufacturing that was selling phone card dispensing machines. So I realized and I thought to myself, well, everybody can have to buy a phone card, and if I buy the machines and put phone cards in them and put them everywhere, all over the place, that might be a good idea. So, flew to Canada, where the company is located. I purchased 30 machines for them, and I call every gas station owner, every food store owner, city market, everyone you name, and, I, and all the high traffic areas, and I was able to install 30 of them into those locations. Opened up the paper one day and I saw the telco was, had a tender in there to supply them with phones and then through my relationships in Miami, I knew a couple of phone suppliers. So I submitted a tender and say, you know, it'll take a long shot. And to my surprise, they awarded me the tender to provide them with 10,000 cell phones. I didn't even have the money to buy 10,000 cell phones. So I took the letter to Miami and sat with this guy that I knew had to sell cell phones. I say, man, I show him it, and he trust me with 10,000 cell phones and sent him to Nassau and sold him to Patelco. And there I was. 
I'd never have a job in my life, and I had managed to save two million dollars in the bank at age 19. Oh. Fast tracking to the age of 23, started like business, started to fade, and cell phones and phone cards had emerged as my primary business. I also decided at the time to rename my hole in the wall and when space had come available, and I renamed the store to Electronic Doctors. And I expanded my product line to include appliances and TVs and DVDs and you name it. I always stayed on top of what was in demand. I even used to sell fish in Congo that I brought from Auckland's and sold to restaurants. Whatever it was, I, whatever the demand was, I sought to fill it. And that's what you gotta do. You gotta stay on top of what's in demand. Stop getting into these saturated business. You gotta stay one step ahead of your competitors at all times. Travel the trade shows. Be on top of what's the next best thing. Don't sink with the ship. And like everything else, nothing lasts forever. My phone card business and by 2006, sorry, my phone card business by 2006, it started to dwindle down and it was getting completely saturated and there I was on the quest for the next big thing. At the age of 24, I had booked a ticket to what to this day is still the longest plane I ever been off. I flew to Guangzhou, China to attend the Canton Trade Fair. I'll give you a little history about the Canton Trade Fair. It happens twice a year, every April, every October, and it's been happening for about 62 years, so it's by all means, it's no secret. But I remember when I went to the Canton Fair, I was blown away, not just by the size of it, because it's massive. It's probably three times the size of this hotel. It was massive. And they had everything about anything under the roof. There was machines to manufacture about anything. They were distributing furniture, food, medical supplies, school supplies, every single thing that you consume or use, even like stay, anything, they had everything. And that trip would lay, later set the stage for my next business venture, real estate. 2006, I recognized that there was a niche in providing affordable houses out west. So armed um, with all the supplies that I had met at the Canton Fair, I was able to build condos at, and offer them at extraordinarily low prices and made the West affordable for Bahamians. I got, got my first loan from First Caribbean when they used to lend me money. And, but that assisted my, my funding and my first real estate venture called Hampton Ridge, what happened to Solo in 14 days. And then my love for real estate had grown. I quickly jumped in full gear in Operation West for Less and started projects like Balmoral, Vizcaya, Veneto, and the latest Venetian West. In 2009, after coming from one of the biggest trade shows in London, Island Luck was born. My journey, by all means, was not an easy one. Through my entire life, I've hit almost every single roadblock you can imagine. And most of it wasn't from the challenges of the businesses themselves. It was from my very own Bohemian brothers and sisters <laughs> that tried to pull me down all my life up to this day. They gave me a radio license the other day. One man got 10 license and he ain't sleep since I get the license. Could you imagine? Ladies and gentlemen, I submitted an application over two years ago to provide every bohemian a share of island luck. And up to this day, they run in around in cycles, but they don't want you to have nothing. 
And I ain't scared to call them out. They don't want us to have nothing. <laughs> but one thing we must not let happen. We must never allow them to distract us from our vision or derail us from our goals. Future entrepreneurs, you will face the same bumps in the roads. They can come dresses, friends, family, politicians, co-workers. But you got to keep your eye on the road and keep on hustling. And hustle so hard, tell them haters ask you for a job. I want you to wake up every morning and kill them with success and bury them with a smile. You know, life can be defined as a series of chapters proliferated with ups and downs and happiness and sadness, love and accomplishment, failures and heartbreaks, opportunities missed, and goals achieved. And sometimes life could be like that GPS that seems it could only get you within one mile of where you're trying to go. But if you end up one mile from your destination, then get out and walk the rest of the way. Like Selinden like said, when the elevator is broken, take the stairs. And see, that's how I know it all made sense. And this is where a recalibration of the mindset comes in. Because you can't reach your destination to success if your mind on the wrong route. We have to do a complete 180. I was going to say 360, but they say when you do 360, it's on up right back where you start. So you have to do a complete 180. You can't continue to solve the problems with the same way of thinking you used to create them. A negative thinker will see a difficulty in every opportunity. And a positive thinker sees an opportunity in every difficulty. You can't have a million dollar dream with a minimum wage mindset. You know, winners make it happen, and losers let it happen. If you have an idea, go after it. If your business is failing, make changes. If you can't figure out what to do, go to a trade show. Limits are for credit cards, and it's time to max out your potential. You cannot write a check, expect it to clear, and all you is deposit to the bank is excuses. <laughs> now, by all means, I have a bachelor's degree in failed relationships. I oh, know. <laughs> anyway, but I'm going to give you some relationship advice. It's, it's time to get married to your dreams, cheat on your affairs, and break up with your doubts. And that's what I call a real relationship right there. And I know a lot of you, including myself, is ready to see the world's greatest motivational speaker of all time. So before I go, I want to leave you with this. Serious. This is powerful. But you can you turn it down a little? I can't even hear myself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you want something you've never had, you're gonna have to do something you've never done. If you don't start working on building your dreams, someone will hire you to work on theirs. 
Remember in business, we never lose. We either win or we learn. A lot of us are concerned about our future, but the best way to predict your future is to create it. And I'll leave you with this. If you are persistent, you'll get it. But if you are consistent, you will keep it. Please. Really? Do something I never done. They just, she said, I have to do nothing like that. Now, you ain't from one of them parts of the world where you just. She said, do something I never done. I can't be a hypocrite, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what in this bag, but I'm going to do something I never done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I love you all. I want to show you guys something real cool, something I just found out. Watch this. See, every pilot or flight instructor will tell you this, that if you start here and you want to go here to your destination, and if there's a crosswind, you will actually land here, land lower. So what pilots do is they fly north of their destination to get to their destination. See, this metaphor applies for, for life and for people as well. If you treat a person for how they are, you make them worse. You treat a person for how they could be, you promote them to what they should be. If you live life being realistic, you wind up being pessimistic. But if you live life shooting for your dreams, trying to, trying to do the impossible, well, ladies and gentlemen, you will wind up exactly where you need to be. Let me say something really, really quick. In church, I think they call it conviction. And as I'm listening to these talks and as I'm listening to these speeches, sometimes, I don't know about you all, but I'm gonna give you a little secret of what I do. I look at particular funerals that I need to go to, and I'm never really going to the funeral for a funeral. Because that is the only place that I could scream, cry, get my frustrations out, and sometimes think myself out of a box and recognize that I only have one life to live. And so right now, if you are in your seat, if you need to stand up and you just need to shout, I can do it right now. I believe you could do just a little bit better than that. If you are in your seat and you know that you know that you know that you know that there's something that you gotta do different there's more that you gotta do for yourself and you know that you can do it, let me hear you say, I can. I can. You know, I listened to Sabah's speech and what was so interesting about that is, I remember that there were so many people who told me what I could not be and what I could not do. There were so many people who told me that I could not be a director in government at 29 years old. And I remember going on, um, Madam President, I was going on Bahamas Air, and when I went on Bahamas Air, the lady said, hey, um, Mr. Turnquist, can you come with us, please? We're gonna board you on the plane first. I said, not a problem, welcome aboard Bahamas Air. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm being really, really serious. Michelle Malcolm is here, and she's heard this story from me, and when I got there, I sat in the plane, looked as if it was about to explode because there was smoke coming out. Of the, uh, of the vents, and she said, Mr. Turnquist, can I get you something to drink? I said, Jesus, <laughs> my God, make a way. <laughs> hey, won't he do it? Yes, he will. You mean I get um, something to drink on Bahamas Air? <laughs> so I said, you know, this doesn't happen every day, Madam President, so I'ma take this while I need it right now. And I said, well, how long is the flight to Grand Bahama, ma'am? 
She said, the flight is 45 minutes. I said, ma'am, I will have tea, coffee, and water. She said, I'm sorry, Mr. Turnquist, our director? You mean tea, I said, yes. I'm gonna have coffee for the first 15 minutes of the flight, followed by some tea for the second 15 minutes of the flight. And the final 15 minutes of this flight, I'll have some water just to wash everything down. May I have your further attention for the in-flight safety demonstration, ladies and gentlemen. As one of the world's most renowned motivational speakers, Les Brown is a dynamic personality and highly sought after resource in business and professional circles for Fortune 500 CEOs, small business owners, nonprofit and community leaders from all sectors of society looking to expand opportunity. For three decades, he has not only studied the science of achievement, he's mastered it by interviewing hundreds of successful business leaders and collaborating with them. Les Brown energizes people to meet the challenges of the world around them. He skillfully weaves his compelling life story into the fabric of our daily lives. Addressing audiences from Denmark to Dubai, Canada to the Caribbean, Les Brown has the unique ability to connect deeply with people from all walks of life. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here in the Bahamas, Welcome a man who is committed to motivating and training today's generation to achievers and leaders as he introduces new audiences every day to his not over until you win, up thoughts for down times and fight for your dream concepts. Please stand with me and welcome the incomparable Les Brown. Thank you. I, I thought they were gonna bring me on with Funky Nassau, you know? What happened to that? You may be seated, all right. I love you back, let the record show. I am so very glad to, to be here to spend some time with you. And one of the things I was reflecting on in preparing is that there's some things you can't see while you're going through it or see looking forward, but once you look back, things come together. And they said, you know, I'm adopted, and they said my birth mother was in a part of South Florida cutting sugar cane. I met this guy from the Bahamas and and he fixed us a ball group and she got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Something in the gravy. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. But I want to, I want to, where, where's, where's Sebastian? Where, where, where are you? Oh, right, yeah. Let's give him a round of applause for his vision. Thank you so much. I had an opportunity to talk to this young man. You're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. He's very brilliant and I appreciate his commitment, his passion for you and, and for the future of the Bahamas and what it is that he wants to do. And I want you to know that it's achievable. Let's give him another tremendous round of applause. <laughs> Sophia White, who manages me, give her a round of applause. And Gladys Fernander, Fernander, she's my business partner here from the Bahamas. Give her a round of applause. Stand up, Gladys. She bought me some ball grouper and some pigeon peas and rice. I say, you hook her the brother up up in here. And Denise Zama, my love, give her a round of applause. All right. And this is partner. I'm excited about being here, and I want to share with you some thoughts. And I want you to think about some major goal that you'd like to achieve personally and some major goal that you'd like to achieve professionally. And I'd like for you to think about some goal that you want to achieve in a social context, your contribution. 
Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. And there's something that I want you to embrace right now. When you leave here, I want this to resonate in your, in your mind and in your heart and in your spirit. And I want you to spread this because words are powerful. My favorite book says, death and life is in the tongue. And, and that's a strategic message. Why? Why do not say life and death is in the tongue? Well, the reason is that most of us speak death more than we do life. And you have to be mindful of what you say because your words have power. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. And dwelt among men, your words have power. And in this room, in this room, at this point in time in history, on this day, we have the power for historians to look back and see that this was a, a catalytic, transformative moment here in the islands. Repeat after me, please. This is, this is. everybody together, this is. Our winning, our winning season. Say it again. This is, this is our, winning our winning season. It's our time, it's our time to, go to, to go to the next level. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, let's play a bigger game. Do that right now. <laughs> this is your winning season. Things have changed, and this is your winning season. Get to know that, get to be with that, and affirm that to yourself every day, because it's true. But you must affirm that and believe that. When I think about my life, born in, in, in Liberty City in Miami, an abandoned building on a floor with my twin brother, and I sat on this stage because of two women. One gave me life, the other one gave me love. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother. Mama worked on Miami Beach for wealthy families. She cooked for these families and we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. She kept their children and we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. I'm a mama's boy. I used to follow around these big, beautiful homes. My mother could bake, too. She was awesome in the kitchen. She could bake a sweet potato pie so good you couldn't eat it with your shoes on. <laughs> yeah, kick your shoes off so you could wiggle your toes. <laughs> and, and, and being in these big, beautiful mansions, I used to say to her, Mama, what is it, Leslie? When I become a man, I'm going to buy you a big, beautiful home just like this. Living in an overtown in Liberty City, we had hard linoleum floors. Millenniums don't know anything about that. And they had carpet. We had fans. They had air conditioners. And I admired my mother, her courage, her determination. I remember her getting up in the morning and saying, oh, Arthur's bothering me. I said, Mama, who's Arthur? She said, don't worry, boy. You live long enough, you'll find out. She was talking about arthritis. <laughs> Mama, what is it, Leslie? Why do you all say every Sunday, thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning? She said, don't worry. You live long enough, you'll find out. I went in the room the other day to find something. I got in there, and I couldn't remember what I was looking for. <laughs> I came out the room, remember what I was looking for, went in there and I found it. Then I couldn't remember why I was looking for it. <laughs> My kid said, Daddy, you need some gecko bull over, you know? I went down to Walgreens, I was walking around, a lady said, may I help you? I said, I forgot why I'm here. <laughs> she said, you need something for your memory. So they gave me a few vitamins, I took them home. Now I can't remember where I put them. <laughs> So when I got up this morning, I said, I thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I 
But here's something that I know. As you look at yourself, I want you to think about some goal that you want to achieve personally. My first personal goal was to buy my mother a home. That was important to me. She adopted me and six other children. And I was determined that I want to do that. I was hungry to take care of her as she took care of us. What are you hungry for? Who is it in your life that you'd like to do something special for? And then I want you to think about your financial goal. I want you to come up with a financial number and that once you earn that, that will alleviate a lot of stress. Once you earn that, that it will give you the opportunity to make choices, to travel, to do things for people that you care about. And I, I want you to think about creating wealth. People say money won't make you happy, but everybody want to find out for themselves. <laughs> Let me tell you something, fellas. Even if you're as homeless as I am, you got some money. Women will find something cute on you. <laughs> oh, he's got eyelashes like Denzel Washington, honey. He's got eyes like Terrence Howard. <laughs> I used to be so broke, I walked past the bank and tripped the alarm. <laughs> Creditors called the house, and this is before caller ID. And my children would answer the phone and just lie. My daddy said he ain't home. <laughs> oh, poverty sucks. Let me tell you something. I feel better when I have some money. I don't, I don't even have to take my medication as often. <laughs> you know. The red fox said, buddy can't buy you happiness, but can make a hell of a down payment. <laughs> oh, behave, whatever, I'm sorry. I got issues, I got issues, okay. But I want you to think about your financial freedom number. So that if something happened, how many of you have children? Raise your hands, please. If something happened to someone you care about, you want to be in a position to do more than just pray for them. <laughs> My oldest son had a stroke a year and a half ago. And the healthcare practitioners, practitioners it cost around $3,000 a week and it was not covered by insurance. And I was glad that I was able to be in a position to take care of it. You have the ability to create wealth. Now I want you to think about your social contribution. That's what I admire about you. you you've decided that you want to give something back to this great island of, of great people here. That's a great example in a bar that you're setting for others to emulate. Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. John, one great man, James Johnson, stony the road we trod, bitter the chesting rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet, with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We've come over a way that with tears have been watered. We've come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. Somebody paid a price for us to enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. Somebody paid a price for that. And so we have a debt to pay. I want you to think about your goals and dreams, your personal goals, your financial goals, your social contribution to this great island. And let us say together, it's possible. It's possible. Say it again with conviction, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. it's possible, the things that you envision. We're going through a critical time in history, the era of what the late Peter Drucker called the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. Just in the United States alone, over 20,000 jobs are being replaced by technology. It's being impacted here in the Bahamas as well. And as you think about your goals and dreams, 
It's not about being intimidated by technology. It's about what is it you need to do to reinvent yourself? What is it you need to do as you look and see that millions of jobs are being eliminated globally? My sister was working for a major bank in the United States and they came to my sister Sharon and said, your division has been eliminated. And we've flown in the people from the country where your job has been outsourced to. And you must train them if you're going to get your severance pay. We will test them. And if they don't pass the test, you won't get your severance pay. That's wrong. That's like getting out of a marriage that you don't like and, and the person that you're with, they found somebody else and you got to train them. <laughs> Something's wrong with that. Can you feel a brother up in here? I mean, that's not right. And so it's called life. Forrest Gump was right. That life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. My favorite book says, think it not strange that you'll face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might. You will have tribulations. Things are going to happen to you. 21 years ago, a doctor looked at me and said, look, cancer's metastasized to seven areas of your body. Uh, your chances of surviving beyond six to eight months are slim to none. I said, I'll take slim. You know? <laughs> He said, I have cancer? He said, yes. I said, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> oh, behave, whatever. <laughs> Things happen in life. And don't ask, why did this have to happen to you? You know, why not you? Who would you suggest? <laughs> Although I could give God some emails and some addresses and some names. But stuff happens in life. And as you think about your goals and dreams, what's most important, I want you to write this down, your mindset. Yes, you gotta work on your mindset. Because things are going to happen that you cannot anticipate. This is a new place in history. This is a new economy. And things are changing rapidly. And you have to be resilient. You have to Position yourself in four areas, faith, family, finance, and fun. You want to integrate all of that together. And your faith is very important because you're going to have some setbacks. You're going to have some failures. People you thought you can count on, they won't be there. There are people who should be in this room, they're not here because they have an entertainment-driven awareness. In order to make it in this new economy, you have to have an achievement-driven mindset. You have to think in terms of creating your own personal economy, of developing yourself, your mindset, and your skill set. You don't get paid by the hour. What, what skills, what knowledge, write this down, knowledge is the new currency. What knowledge do you have? What value, what skills are you going to provide? What service are you going to make available in the marketplace? It's a new day. It's a book out now called The End of Work. Been around for around six years, 500 pages. Most people have not read it. It's talking about how technology is eliminating millions of jobs every day. And so now, it's a crisis, and crisis in the Chinese language, it means danger, and it means opportunity. And you have an opportunity here. Living here, you have an advantage from countries that are larger than you are. You have an advantage. Come on, Les, what are you talking about? Shake someone's hand on your right and left, look them in the eyes and say, Goliath lost. Goliath lost. Because you're so small, just over a quarter of a million people, you have a chance to change the collective mindset. 
to create a mindset of entrepreneurship, a mindset where people begin to see the value of engaging and learning the things they need to learn so that you can begin to be a go-to resource place, not where people just come to have a vacation, but because of the skills you have, because of the knowledge that you have, because of the value that you provide, because of the service that you provide. Not just to come here and, and, and eat and dance and drink and go back home, but come and see this as a destination spot because how you have educated and created a new culture beyond entertainment, a new culture of collaborative, achievement-driven, supported relationships. You have the ability to do that, unlike a Chicago or, or Miami or New York. Why? Too many people. This is, you are contained. You have a limited number of people. You, you control, you have access to media. And so you have the ability to influence the thinking and the attitudes and the behavior and the knowledge of people here in a controlled environment. That's rare. It's very rare. I first finished speaking this morning in Detroit, Michigan. It used to be a, a, a city that, that billions of dollars earned in the music industry, and then in the automobile industry, and then automation came in, and then information and technology, and everything changed. Quincy Jones had a song years ago, everything must change. Nothing stays the same. This is your winning season. As you begin to share the vision of a new Bahamas, a, a, the vision of people coming together, families, using technology. Just imagine 2007, Time Magazine said, the computer is the person of the year. Why? Because for the first time in the history of the world, everyday people have access to information they've never had before. In the United States, if you were an African-American, a person of color trying to learn how to read, it would be a capital offense. Now, you can learn anything online, any area. People are getting law degrees, medical degrees, CPAs, all type of degrees online. More millionaires are being created online than ever before. Now with just your telephone, your telephone, you can become a global entrepreneur. I know a young lady by the name of Sonia Rochetti. She earns over $9 million a year at home. She doesn't want to go speaking all over the world. She's been taking care of her mother, doing it from the comfort of her home. There's a young lady that I was telling our friend about that, Alicia, Alicia Little, she, she teach people and she's doing it in, in Jamaica now, how to earn money the first day in the training online, serving customers globally that you never touch the products, you don't even have to have a, a, a warehouse, and how using strategic relationships, you can create your own business so that you are now in charge of your own life. This requires a new mindset. That's why we're taught, be ye not conformed to this world. Don't follow everybody else's pattern. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Dr. Carter G. Woodson said, if you can determine what a man shall think, you never have to concern yourself with what he will do. He said, if you can make a man feel inferior, you never have to compel him to seek an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. And if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, never have to order him to go to the back door, he'll go without being told. And if there's no door, his very nature will demand one. I was watching the young men here on the island. And I was impressed with when, when I looked at so many of them at the airport when I came in. Because there's a virus going on in the United States that is not as prevalent here as it is there, although many things that we do over there, you bring here, that's not in your best interest. 
in the United States. <laughs> they have programming that does not serve people. You can't tell me that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X died so we can have Atlanta housewives. If you go online and look at YouTube and see the vulgarity and the filth and the violence and the ignorance, there's something wrong with that. In order to make it and believe that this is your winning season, you have to hold yourself to a higher standard. You have the opportunity to create a culture here, even more so where people look forward to come here because of the love, because of the warmth. And that's just who you are as Bahamians. A place where people can feel safe and enjoy their family and come and learn and grow and, and expand mentally and emotionally and spiritually. You have a chance to create and make this the Wakanda. Come on, somebody. <laughs> can you feel a brother up in here, up in here? Let us say together, it's possible. We can create a more attractive island of knowledgeable people, entrepreneurs, innovation, creativeness, a place where people look forward to coming, to retreat, to replenish themselves, to reinvent themselves, and go out and make global impact. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, we can do that. <laughs> this is time that you have to be uncommon. Not only is it possible, but to hold yourself to a different kind of standard. Henry David Thoreau said, do not go where the path may lead. Go where there's no path and leave a trail. You don't want to be like everybody else. You want to be uncommon. One guy wrote, he said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dulled by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. He said, I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the still calm of utopia. I will never cower before any master nor bend to any threat. It's my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid and face the world boldly and say, this I have done. You've showed up here this evening and the vision that this island now has for itself in the future because you are uncommon. Give yourselves a round of applause. Bring your energy level up. Bring your energy level up. So let us say together, it's possible. It's possible. I can have my dream. Have my dream. It's, necessary. it's necessary. Say it again, it's necessary. it's necessary. See, if you're casual about your dream, you end up a casualty. You've got to decide that it's necessary. I told my mother, Mama, I'm going to buy you home one day. That was not something nice to say. I was serious. I'll never forget, and I was driving her at North Miami Beach area, and she saw this big, beautiful home. I drove in that area deliberately. It's on an acre of land and beautiful water fountain in front. And she said, slow down, Leslie. I said, what is it, mama? She said, look at that big, beautiful home. She said, if I lived in something like that, I'd feel like Mrs. Rockefeller. <laughs> and she's talking about, this wealthy wife of John D. Rockefeller. She read about it in the Miami Herald. I said, you really like that, Mama? She said, yes. And I knew that she would, and I decided that I was going to do it. I want you to think about some goal that you have. And I want it to be a big goal. That was a big goal. I didn't have the money. I didn't have a contract. I had no idea how I was going to do it. And I'm in encouraging you, get a big goal beyond your comfort zone. 
And, and don't worry about how you're going to do it. My favorite book says, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. There's some things you can do that you don't know right now because we've been trained and programmed to be practical and logical and realistic. No. And, and as a result of that practical, logical, realistic thinking and, and being conditioned not to want to make mistakes or fail, we stop ourselves. 86% of people allow their fear of failure to have big dreams. Repeat after me, please. Risk winning. Risk winning. Yes, I didn't do what I'm doing now because I don't want to risk losing or being embarrassed. I used to go see Zig Ziglar and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Robert Shuler and Tony Robbins and my heart said, I can do that. But my mind being practical and logical and realistic, Les Brown, how can you do that? You don't have a college education. Les Brown, how can you do that? You never worked for a major corporation. Les Brown, how can you with no money and no resources and no contacts and corporations develop the level of credibility that somebody's going to pay you to come and talk to them. What do you have to say? How many ever thought about something you wanted to do and you talk yourself out of it? Raise your hands, please. You know what I'm talking about. I never forget something happened to me. Let us say together, interruption. interruption. And that's what I'm doing with you right now. I'm interrupting your thinking. I, I went in this, this man's class, Mr. Leroy Washington. He said, young man, go to board and work this problem out for me. I said, oh, sir, I can't do that. Why not? I'm not one of your students. I'm just here to see a friend of mine, Mac Alpha Stevens. He said, go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, I can't, sir. And the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. He said, what's DT? He's a dumb twin. And the students erupted in laughter, just as some of you did. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. <laughs> that was a turning point in my life. That was an interruption. On the one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is, he only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be, then he becomes what he should be. See, when I was in the fifth grade, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I fell again when I was in the eighth grade. But I met him my junior year and I discovered something. How we live our lives is a result of the story we believe about ourselves. And when you live in an environment where you have systems of racism and discrimination or you've been colonized and it's passed on a mindset generation after generation after generation and, and that mindset is not interrupted. See, fleas have the physical capacity to jump 20 inches high, but if you put fleas in a, in a jar and put a top on and watch them, they'll jump up and down, up and down, and if you listen, they'll hit their heads. And after a while, they'll jump up and down, and they won't hit their heads. And then if you take the top off, they'll jump up and down, up and down, up and down, and they won't jump out because they've been conditioned. But here's the tragic part, and why it's important why you have your daughter here, and why I have my daughter here, which I'm gonna be calling up very shortly, is that when they have baby fleas, the baby fleas born with the physical capacity to jump 20 inches high will jump just below 20 inches. Why? Because of the environment. An extensive book written by Martin Seligman from the University of Minnesota said between the ages of zero and five, a word is formulated in your heart. It's yes or it's no based upon the conversations you hear, based upon your environment, based upon the people that you look at, the people who talk to you, the people who communicate with you. You formulate a vision about yourself that follows you for the rest of your life. And so what is required and what you're doing is an interruption. 
distract, dispute, and inspire. He distracted me from what I believed about myself. While in school, up to my junior year, I saw myself as being educable, mentally retarded. DT, the dumb twin. At first, they called me that. I got angry. After a while, it became no big deal, and I started answering to it. And my grades reflected that. I know something about you, and I don't know you, that you have greatness in you. You were born with greatness. Greater is he than in you, that he that's in the world. You are more than a conqueror. You're born with greatness, but you've been programmed to fail. That's why this work, this time that we're gathering here is important. And that you decide when you leave here to become a messenger of hope. Because when there's hope in the future, it gives you power in the present. Every 20 seconds, somebody commits suicide. Why? Because they feel hopeless and helpless. And you, you have an energy signature. There's some people I'm going to reach. There's some people that you're going to reach. They're part of who you are, the frequency behind your voice. And so as you think about your goals and dreams, decide that it's necessary. Next thing is, I'm encouraging you to get a three by five card as you think about your goals. On one side, put down one goal, the one that's most important to you. On the flip side, put Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. And read that three times a day. I did that. I, I walked around Liberty City in Overtown with that three by five card. And I said, I'm the world's greatest orator. I had no idea that in 1992, when Toastmasters selected the top five speakers in the world, General Norman Schwarzkopf, Robert Schuller, Paul Harvey, and Leah Coker, that I would be among them. I had no idea that the National Speakers Association selected me the top speaker in the world. There are things that you're going to do as a result of becoming a part of this movement that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor is in the heart of mankind what God has in store for you. And the fact that you can't see it does not matter. You don't have to see it. And the fact that you don't know how to do it, that's none of your business. That's God's business. What's most important, commit yourself. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Commit yourself to do the work. And as you focus on your goals and dreams, and you write your goals down, and you review them on a regular basis, what you're literally doing is programming yourself, reversing the mental disrepair, dismantling the current belief system that you now have to create a new reality for yourself. Next thing that's very important, look at your relationships. Write this down, OQP, only quality people. In order to be successful, you want to surround yourself with people that you can learn from people you can grow from. There's some people you need to let go of. Repeat after me, please. Let go. Let go. Or, be or be dragged. Yeah, there's some people you need to let go of. They're going to drag you down, including family. There are two types of relationships. There are nourishing relationships and toxic relationships. Nourishing relationships, they bring the best out of you. They challenge you. They really grow on you in a positive way. Toxic relationships, they drain you. They'll bring the worst out of you. Les, can I change them? No. It's a full-time job changing yourself. Some people are so negative, they can walk into a dark room and begin to develop. Oh, behave. <laughs> Millenniums, they don't know about that. They don't know about that. Come up here, Honor. This is my daughter, Honor. Give her a round of applause. Come on, baby. She's going to share some thoughts with you. They have some steps. They have, she said, yes, she's too old to come this way. Come on, go around. around her. She said, they have some steps? Come on, baby. You got to give my daughter a better round of applause than that. Come on. Thank you, Daddy. 
How are you doing this evening? One of the things that I've learned working with my father nationally and internationally for over 23 years is the importance of challenging yourself. Let me hear you say, I'm going to challenge myself. I was afraid of speaking. I saw myself as an introvert. I saw myself as someone who was shy and would never be able to take the stage. And then all of a sudden, we had a challenging time as a family. We were in the eye of the storm. Has anyone ever been in the eye of the storm? We were, my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer and he was given three to five years to live. And during that time, there was a lot of crying. There was a lot of pain he was dealing with. And so I gave him the master bedroom of my place and we were juicing organic fruits and vegetables to feed life to the cells. And we were praying every day and we were meditating every day. And I would play some of his positive messages and some of the positive messages of Bishop T.D. Jakes and Dr. Miles Monroe. I call, call him Uncle Miles. I love Uncle Miles. And so we were going through this challenge and during this time, while my father was in the process of healing, he said, oh, I need you to come into the room. I need to confide in you about something. I said, dad, you can talk to me about anything. What is it? He said, well, I've been eavesdropping on your phone calls. <laughs> I said, is that right? He said, yes. And I said, and why would you do that? He said, cause I was bored and I didn't have nothing else to do. He said, but as a result of me being nosy, I made an amazing discovery, Ona. You are a powerful speaker and a powerful coach. You're just using the telephone as your microphone. I said, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> he said, no, 98.9% .9 of the people that call here, this is what you do. You uplift them, you encourage them, you give them methods and techniques to take their lives to the level to the next level. You love to help people. How many of you love to help people? Yes. And so I knew that that was something I love to do, but I saw myself in a limited perception. I saw myself in a box. And what my father was doing was trying to stretch me outside of the box. And I started resisting it. How many have ever had someone see something in you that didn't fit into the box of how you saw yourself, so you rejected it? Yes? And so finally, I kept saying, no, that's not what I do. I, I know who I am. I'm your number one salesperson in the back of the room. I'm the person who does the research on the corporations and gives you an outline so you can give a powerful presentation and get a standing ovation. I negotiated your first highest paid international contract. I know who I am, but I cannot speak. That's not me. He said, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. He said, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. And finally, he used wisdom. Let me hear you say, Wisdom. wisdom. That was weak. Let me hear you say wisdom. wisdom. He said, you know what? Maybe you're not a speaker. Maybe you're not a coach, but you sure tell a great story. I said, I do tell a pretty good story now. <laughs> he said, well, would you be willing to just come on stage and tell a story? You ain't got to speak or nothing. I said, okay, I'll come on stage and tell a story, but I'm not speaking. <laughs> Duh. I still can't believe he tricked me with that. So I got on stage and I told the story and I felt a connection between myself and the audience. I saw people having these aha moments and people came up to me afterwards and said, thank you. You spoke into my life. Thank you. That was for me. Thank you. I needed that. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So I remember I would just go up on stage in the beginning stages of, of my speaking, and I would just tell a story. And I'd just do like 10 or 15 minutes. And one time I went up and I told a story, and then I threw in a quote, and I, I backed it up with a, with a statistic, and then threw in a scripture, and I was going for a good 45 minutes strong. And Dad came up and said, excuse me, can I get the mic? I said, back up, brother, I'm on a roll. Repeat after me, this is my time. I'm ready. I'm willing to stretch myself, to do things that make me uncomfortable, to challenge the old me, to let go of who I am for who I can become, starting now. Mm -hmm. 
And this is one of the things that I'm so proud of my father because he's not just a father, he's a friend. And he has really showed my family the power of a made up mind and someone who is willing to come outside of their comfort zone, which is what Dr. Brian Tracy calls the danger zone. So if you're too comfortable, it's not gonna work. Turn to the person on your right and left, say it's okay to be uncomfortable. So as we look at ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, it's about raising the bar on ourselves and doing things that make us shake on the inside. And that's what my father has been able to do. I remember one time I said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of, of being this person that stands before you and I'm ashamed that I don't know how to swim. I know that sounds crazy to you, especially being here. I'm a grown woman who doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> I'm being honest. I know that's crazy. So I decided that I was going to do something to change this because I was tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Has everyone ever, anyone ever been there before? I've seen three and four year olds swim, so I decided I was going to do this thing. And, and I got in my, my bathtub and I started practicing the things that I saw people do. And so then I went out into the pool and I decided I was going to I was gonna do the swimming thing, and so I'm making my motions, and all of a sudden, I lost my footing. And in the midst of me losing my footing, I panicked. So I'm yelling and screaming for help, and I notice no one's coming to save me. I think this is a conspiracy. These people wanna see me die. And all of a sudden, I heard someone say, stand up! <laughs> Here I am, five, nine and a half, drowning in three feet of water. So this is what happens sometimes in life as entrepreneurs, as, as people that are visionaries, as people that are coming out of our comfort zones. You might lose your footing when you leave this powerful session. And you might somehow start to panic and get overwhelmed by the waves of bills, the waves of negative inner conversation, the waves of fear, the waves of doubt the ways of toxic, draining relationships. But all you have to remember to do is to stand up. Stand up for your dream. Stand up for your goal. Stand up for own. Why are you still sitting down? Stand up for your community. Stand up for your family. Stand up for what you believe in. Stand up for your vision. And as I close, I want to tell you this before you take your seat. You may have to drink half the pool on the way up, but turn to the person on your right and le left and say the chlorine is sweet, baby. Honor Brown, give my daughter a round of applause. We have a program where we train and teach you how to do basically the things of what it takes to become a global entrepreneur. One is your mindset. I want you to go on YouTube and I want you for the next 90 days to watch Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome. Speech is called, it's not over till you win. I'm speaking to over 80,000 people. When I did that speech, I was sleeping in my office in Detroit, Michigan in the Penobscot building on the 20 floors, 21st floor, bathing in the sink down the hall going through some tough times. Robert Shuler is right, tough times never last, but tough people do. Yeah. Next thing is, have a goal that will challenge you, a goal that's outside of your comfort zone. Why? Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. And it challenges you. I encourage you to buy the book, go on Amazon, buy the book called The Road to Your Best Stuff. The Road to Your Best Stuff is by Mike Williams. He's been my mentor for 49 years. The reason that most people fail is two M's that's important. One is called mistakes, the other one is called a mentor. Most people try and do it by themselves. They make a lot of costly mistakes and they stop and they become frustrated and discouraged and they give up. But the smart ones, they get a mentor. I got a mentor, why? Because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. Muhammad Ali said, I'm the greatest, but he never won a boxing championship without Angelo Dundee in his corner. 
And so you need someone to be your mentor, someone to be your coach, someone to give you guidance, someone who's accomplished and who has achieved what it is you want to achieve, someone that you respect and trust that, that you'd be willing to listen to. And for those of you that would like to be coach and want to become an entrepreneur, I have some things that I will send you that will be very helpful to you and give it to you as a gift for being here tonight. Just email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com and do it within 24 hours so that I can distinguish it from all of the other emails and send these videos out to you and some other strategies and information that will help you to develop the entrepreneur in yourself. That's lesbrown77 at gmail.com. Seven is my lucky number. I'm one of seven children. I was born February the 17th. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. Naaman dipped himself in the River Jordan seven times. That I tell you, seven is my lucky number. So make sure you do that right away. And we're going to send you some videos and information that will help you to get started. The next thing is you look at your goals and dreams. Let us say together, it's me. Yeah, see, the people who are going to live their dreams rather than their fears, they take total responsibility. George Bernard Shaw said that people that make it in this life, they look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. And so decide to take personal responsibility for your life. Here's the next thing. Write this down. It's hard. It's hard. Everybody together, it's hard. How many of you know it's hard? Raise your hands, please. I didn't do what I'm doing now because I thought it would be hard. It would be hard for me to compete with people with PhDs and MBAs and credentials that I don't have. It would be hard for me to break into the corporate setting and be able to train for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, General Electric, IBM, clients that I have now. I thought it would be hard, and it was hard. And my mentor said, Brownie, he said, if you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. It's going to be hard for, the re for you to reinvent yourself to going from having a job to becoming an entrepreneur, going from working from nine to five to work from five until you faint. <laughs> That's what's required. It's hard, but I can tell you, it's worth it. And I want, when you leave here tonight, I want you to think about what will make it worth it for you. What will make it worth it for you? It was worth everything I needed to do to buy my mother a home. I'll never forget when I drove her back in that area of North Miami Beach, and she said, slow down, Leslie. Boy, look at that big, beautiful home. I said, Mama, you really like that? She said, yes. I said, Mom, I know the people there. She said, you do? I said, yes. I said, would you like to see it? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. She said, sure. And so we drove up to the house. Mama was 78 at the time. I went around and I opened the door. She held me by the arm. We started work, walking toward the house and she stopped and said, Leslie? I said, yes, ma'am. Boy, you sure you know these people? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, Mama, I do. We got to the door. And I couldn't hold back any longer. I put the key in the door and I opened it. I said, Mrs. Rockefeller, this is your home. She said, what are you talking about, Leslie? I said, Mama, I bought this for you. It's fully furnished and, and it's all paid for. She said, Leslie, you, you didn't have to do this. I said, I know. And you didn't have to adopt us either, but you did. She stuck her head in the door and said, is anybody home? <laughs> I said, Mama, there's nobody here but us. And she came in and she walked around and she looked and she touched the furniture and she said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No one could have ever told me something like this would happen to me. And she looked at me and she said, and you were such a crazy child. I said, I know, but I got money now. <laughs> I'll never forget that day. 
It was a special moment. Mom was an incredible woman. She was a 22-year breast cancer conqueror. God blessed us with her at the age of 89. <laughs> Let us sit together, it's possible. I could have my dream. It's necessary. It's necessary. I'm, committed I'm committed to reinvent myself, to, reinvent myself. to, increase, my to increase my skills, my value, my value. to make a greater impact. A greater it's, impact. Me. it's me. I'm taking ownership of my life. It's hard. It's hard. I, can do hard. I can do hard. It's worth it. Yes, when you leave tonight, I want you to write down five reasons and why you are not going to give up on your dream. Five reasons and why you will honor your commitment to become an entrepreneur, to educate yourself, to develop yourself for this global economy. Five reasons. Why? Because Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, you can endure almost anyhow. But when the tough times come, and they're going to come, you're going to fail your way to success. You're going to have disappointments and setbacks and frustrations. And your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you, to maintain your commitment to your commitment. Somebody said, can we really do this? Can, can we transform our lives? Yes. Can we reduce the recidivism rate in our prisons and the dropout rate and and, and transform the mindset of our children and eliminate HIV, hood infected virus, AIDS, addiction to incarceration and death syndrome. Can we do this in our lifetime and, and create a brand new economy for the island? Can we do this? I remember in 1961, President John F. Kennedy called his cabinet together. And he wanted to challenge them. He said, what will it take for us to beat the Russians to the moon? I remember as a kid to illustrate that something was impossible, you would say, you have as much chance of doing that as a man going to the moon. And he looked to Werner Van Braun, most brilliant scientist of that day, to his right. And he said, Warner, what will it take for us to go to the moon? And he said five things, five words, five words. And everybody waited in anticipation that he would say something else. And he didn't. He just dropped his pen. And the president looked around the room and a few days later, he called a news conference and announced to the world and risked global embarrassment. He said, we're going to the moon in 10 years. 10 years. Did it in eight. Didn't have technology. Computers did not exist. Didn't have a budget. Didn't have the know-how. Didn't have a clue. So as you look at yourself, look at, this is your winning season. This is a historic place where you are right now. And as you look into the future, the question becomes, what will it take for you to begin to reinvent yourselves individually and collectively and as a great country? Five words that you should put up in your house on your mirror so you can see it every day. When he looked at Warner, Warner said, when the question was asked, what will it take for us to do it, Warner? He said, the will to do it. The will to do it. What will it take for you to step out of just thinking in terms of a mindset of being an employee and, and step into your greatness and, and see yourself as an entrepreneur and one who provide jobs and create jobs? The will to do it. What will it take for you to Start thinking in terms of being creative and being an innovator and coming up with inventions and ideas that will transform your life and position you to, to create generational wealth. The will to do it. 
What will it take for you to begin to reinvent your school system so that it becomes a, a resource so that you are able to compete globally with countries around the world? And everybody will know you and, and be attracted to this island because of the pool of genius and brain power that's here. The will to do it. I'm gonna ask a question and I want you to say with conviction the will to do it. What will it take for you to come up with ideas that will transform your life and your family's life and be able to create incredible wealth? What will it take for you to begin to come up with some type of innovative place here on this island that people around the world will talk about who you are, what it is you do, how you've reinvented yourselves, and why this is the most attractive place on the planet to come? What will it take for you to create new jobs, new industries, new economies with your genius, with your ideas, with your thoughts, and with your dreams? Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, I have the will. I have My favorite book says, Whosoever will, let him come. So I'd like to leave this with you. I don't know what your goals are beyond why we've gathered here. But here's what I know. You have greatness in you. And when you're pursuing your greatness, you don't know what your limits are, so you act like you don't have any. Here's what I know. Great is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Here's what I know. You're made in the likeness and image of God, and you've been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth. God asked Adam, Adam, where are you? Not because he didn't know, because he wanted Adam to think, Adam, where are you? NASA, where are you in a global context? And I realized that life is a question and how we live our lives is the answer. And so as you think about your goals and dreams, let us say together, you gotta be hungry. Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, what do you want to do with your life, young man? I said, I want to make my mother proud. I want to live a life of meaning, sir. I, I want to touch people's lives like you touched my life, sir. They call you the great communicator. I want to speak like you. I got to speak. I want to help people like you helped me. I've never known my father or my mother. And, and you... You spoke to me. You didn't treat me like everybody else treat me. And you made me feel better about myself. I want to be like you. He said, you got to be hungry, young man. What is it you really enjoy doing? I listen to the radio a lot. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, oh, good. Here are my car keys. What, what's this for? There's a guy named Paul Harvey. He's the world's greatest communicator. At lunchtime, go in my car and listen at lunchtime. He said, anything you want to do, study the people that do that the way you want to do it, because success leaves clues. I don't know what you want to do. It might be pursuing a career in finance, in real estate, in medicine, in legal profession. I don't know, becoming an entrepreneur, being a speaker, being a life coach, I, I don't know. But find someone, go online, do research, spend time learning. I remember when I heard a recording that said the average person reads one book a year. He said, if you make the commitment to read one book a month in five years, when the average person read five books, you'd have read 60 books, that will make you an expert. I did that. I did that, and it changed my life. It changed my life. You can do that too. The reason you are here is because you and I are cut from the same cloth. We're branches of the same tree. I only attract millionaires of millionaires in training. Give yourselves a round of applause.
So I did what Mr. Washington said. I listened, and I listened to all of the broadcasters, and I watched them on television, and I listened on the radio, and I visualized myself doing that. And he told me something else. He said, stop hanging around people who don't want anything in life. Even now, when I take a call, a phone call, it goes through a filter. Make a mental note of this. It has to be positive. If it's not positive, I don't have the mental bandwidth to entertain negative phone calls. It has to be purposeful. Is it in alignment with what I'm doing with my life? It's gotta be positive, purposeful. Is it productive? Can I learn something from this? Is, is it profitable? Does it make sense for me to give my time and energy to this? I'm 74, I don't have time to waste. I look good for 74 too, don't I? Yeah. You know black don't crack. It will get ashy and you need some Vaseline, you know? And I use mascara to cover my gray. <laughs> Oh, no, he didn't, honey. Yes, he did. <laughs> you got to have so strong self-esteem to break this kind of stuff out. I was speaking in the Georgia Dome to 80,000 people as the lady came. She said, oh, Mr. Brown, I know you might be tired, but I'll speak of cancer. Do you have enough energy to give another speech? I said, no. She said, we can pay your full fee of $70,000. I said, the Lord is able. <laughs> So, so they took me over to the Georgia World Congress Center and the audience was close to the stage. And so I said, just a minute, I went in the restroom and I was start, you know, covered the gray. I'd been sweating, you know, trying to hook myself up, you know. The gray was having a revolution, you know. So I came up on the stage and she wanted everybody to know she knew me and she kissed me on the cheek. I kissed her on the cheek and left this big black smudge on her face. <laughs> So, I didn't know what to say, so I just sat down. <laughs> so somebody said, um, there's something on your face. She looked at me, she said, what are they saying? I said, I don't know. <laughs> then so somebody gave her a mirror, you know. She looked, and nobody asked her to do that. This nosy lady getting into Kool-Aid, don't know the flavor. <laughs> she looks to see the big black smudge on her face. She said, how did this get here? I said, I don't know, you think maybe this rubs off? <laughs> So now I use waterproof mascara. <laughs> Sometimes a brother's got to do what he's got to do. But some of y'all need a paintbrush to cover all that stuff in there. So, so, so as, as you look at your goals and dreams, I, I studied every day. And I got a mentor, Mike Williams. Write this down. Invest in yourself. Invest in a mentor, yes, you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. You can't read the label when you're locked in the box. His book is called The Road to Your Best Stuff. It's an entrepreneur's handbook. Make sure you get that. Go on, on Amazon and download it. The audio version as well as the book, The Road to Your Best Stuff. And I'll never forget when I said, Mr. Washington, I. I've changed my relationships. I've been practicing, I'm ready, sir. And he says, good. He said, don't forget, you gotta be hungry. I said, why do you say that? He said, people that are hungry are achievement driven. People that are hungry believe always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. People that are hungry believe no excuse is acceptable for not giving your best at all times under all circumstances. I said, I'm hungry, sir. I'm, I'm hungry to make my mother proud. All my life, people have compared me to my brother who's very smart and my sister who graduated from the University of Miami. I'm hungry, sir. I'm hungry to provide for her and make her proud that she adopted us. He said, it's good. Here's my card. Go to WMBM radio station. Milton Butterball Smith is the program director. Tell him that I sent you. I said, yes, sir. I went to WMBM radio station. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. 
He said, young man, you have any journalism in your background? No, sir, I don't, but let me audition for you, sir. Let me show you how good I am. I've been practicing, sir. I visualize myself being on radio. He said, no, we don't have any job for you. How many of you ever been rejected? Raise your hands, please. I was devastated with rejection. I, I went back, I said, Mr. Washington, they said no. He said, don't take it personally. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you gotta be hungry. Go back again. I said, yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. I know what your name is. Weren't you here yesterday? Yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? Yes, sir. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I didn't know whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. No one was laid off or fired. I get on out of here. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy like I was singing for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Futterfall, how are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir, I like to be a disc jockey. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? Yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? Yes, sir. He said, then why are you back today? Well, sir, I didn't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off or fired. Now, don't you come back here again. I said, yes, sir. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy, like I was singing for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Vodafone, how are you? He looked at me betrayed. He says, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> My favorite book says, the greatest among you will be your servant. How many of you are serious about your goals and dreams? Raise your hands, please. Very good. Write this down. Make a mental note of this. Provide more service than you get paid for. When I came into the speaking business, they told me, you can't succeed in this area. It's too many speakers, over 3,000, and you don't have the money, you don't have the credentials, there's no way. Here's what I want to say to you. Make yourself stand out. I train speakers now, and I teach them how to make themselves stand out with their story, how to create a significant emotional event and transform an audience individually and collectively. And those of you that are here that have a story, those of you that are entrepreneurs, your ability to communicate allows you to be able to make a sell or to make a point or make a difference. Your ability to communicate, if you're involved in multi-level marketing, is to build a strong organization and motivate and inspire people and increase your ability to recruit and bring out the best of the people that you recruit and be able to retain them. Your ability to communicate is major today if you're going to make it. It's mindset, it's the skill set of a communicator. And if you're serious, email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com and we'll come back here and do a training call, Presentation Power, and show you how to begin to create wealth with your story and your skill set and your business. And so at any rate, I became an errand boy for the disc jockeys. Remember this, give before you ask. I would serve them. I'd go get their lunch and their dinner and, and bring it to the disc jockeys. I, I was the guy that served them. And I would look at them working on their control board. And I had a mindset, my time will come. Let us say together, my time will come. And I was preparing myself. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. He began to slur his words. He couldn't complete the show. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was the only one there looking at him through the control room window walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink, rock, I'd have gone get him some more if he'd asked me to. And then pretty soon the phone rang and it was the general manager and I answered the phone. 
He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish the program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now nah, he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn on the radio. I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes and I called him back and said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get old Rock out of the way. I put on a fast record. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle. Certified, bona fide, dubably qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. I was hungry. Shake someone's hand on your right and left in front of you and behind you and say, you gotta be hungry, do that right now. You gotta be hungry. People that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. People that are hungry believe all you can do is all you can do and all you can do is enough, but make sure you do all you can do. People that are hungry believe always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. People that are hungry believe it's better to have money and not need it than to need it and not have it. I don't know you, but here's what I know about you. You have greatness in you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. And I wanna leave this with you. My mother loved this. And this, this new chapter that you're creating, this new chapter that you're becoming, as Mother Teresa would say, a pencil in the hand of God, and start writing a new chapter in your life, in your family's life, and in this great island. Leslie, yes, my mama, say that thing for me, boy, that makes me feel good. Everybody put your hand over your heart. Feel that beat. That beat, that beat, that beat represents life. Life is God's gift to you and how you live your life is your gift to God. That beat, it represents life. You're a masterpiece because you're a piece of the master. You are an unrepeatable miracle. You were created on purpose with a purpose. Miles was right. There's a purpose for your being here. And if you don't do it in a historical context, the world will never be the same again. Leslie, say that thing for me, boy, that makes me feel good. I dedicate this to you and to that dream that's in your heart. For where your heart is, there your treasure is also. If you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and sleep for it. If all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose all your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope, and confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold, poverty, famish, or gold, sickness or pain of body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want, if dogged and grim you besiege and beset it, with the help of God you'll get it. You have something special. You have greatness in you. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. some Bahamian music, man. Where y'all got all that stuff? I want to hear some, play me some hot, hot, hot or something. 
I can move up in here. Did you get some value out of what I just shared with you? Thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless this great island. Did you see Uncle Lou when it Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a round of applause. We've come to the vote of thanks and we'd like to thank our Prime Minister who arrived here this evening. I told you he was stuck on the bridge, but I knew that he would make it here just as if I was stuck on the bridge. So we say to you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. Let's give our speaker another round of applause. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you and have a wonderful night. I got a feeling. That tonight's gonna be a good night That tonight's gonna be a good night That tonight's gonna be a good, good night I feel it That tonight's gonna be a good night That tonight's gonna be a good night That tonight's gonna be a good night